Vlietze, 1912 edition, translated by Cranmer Bing. The object of the editor of this series is a very definite one. He desires, above all things, that these books shall be the ambassador of goodwill between East and West. He hopes that they will contribute to a fuller knowledge of the great cultural heritage of the East, for only through real understanding will the West be able to appreciate the underlying problems and aspirations of Asia today. He is confident that deeper knowledge of the great ideals and lofty philosophy of the Eastern thought will help reveal the revival of that true spirit of charity which neither despises nor fears the nations of another creed or color. The Lietze is also referred to as the Lietze, translated by Cranmer Bing, 1912. The Lietze is attributed to the Taoist sage Lie Yuko, a master within the hundred schools of thought. Introduction, written by Cranmer Bing. The history of Taoist philosophy may be conveniently divided into three stages. The primitive stage, the stage of development, and the stage of degeneration. The first of these stages is only known to us through the medium of a single semi-historical figure, the philosopher Lao Tzu, whose birth is traditionally assigned to the year 604 BC. Some would place the beginnings of Taoism much earlier than this, and consequently regard Lao Tzu rather as an expounder than as the actual founder of this system, just as Confucianism, that is, a moral code based on filial piety, buttressed by altruism and righteousness, may have said to have flourished long before Confucius. The two cases, however, are somewhat dissimilar. The teachings of Lao Tzu, as preserved in the Tao Te Ching, are not such that one can easily imagine being handed down from generation to generation among people at large. The principle on which they are based is simple enough, but their application to everyday life is surrounded by difficulties. It is hazardous to assert that any great system of philosophy has sprung from the brain of one man, but the assertion is probably true for Taoism, as with any body of speculation. Condensed into a single phrase, the injunction of Lao Tzu to mankind is, follow nature. That is a good practical equivalent of the Chinese expression, get hold of Tao. Although Tao is not necessarily corresponding to the word nature, as ordinarily used by us to denote the sum of phenomenon in this ever-changing universe, it seems to me, however, that the conception of Tao must have been reached originally through this channel. Lao Tzu, interpreting the plain facts of nature before his eyes, concludes that behind her manifold workings there exists an ultimate reality, which is in essence unfathomable and unknowable, yet manifests itself in laws of unfailing regularity. To this essential principle, this power underlying the sensible phenomenon of nature, he gives, tentatively and with hesitation, the name Tao, or The Way. Though fully realizing the inadequacy of any term to express the idea which is beyond all power of comprehension, it is named Tao. A foreigner, imbued with Christian ideals, may naturally feel inclined to substitute Tao, the term by which he is accustomed to denote the supreme being, God. But, this is only admissible if he is prepared to use the term God in a far broader context than we find in either the Old or New Testament. That which chiefly impresses the Taoist in the operations of nature is their absolute impersonality. The inexorable law of cause and effect seems to him equally removed from active goodness or benevolence on one hand, and from active malevolence on the other. This is a fact which will hardly be disputed by any intelligent observer. It is when he begins to draw inferences from it that the Taoist parts company from the average Christian, believing, as he does, that the visible universe is but a manifestation of the great invisible power behind it. He feels justified in arguing, from known to the unknown, and concluding that, whatever Tao may be, which itself is unknowable, it is certainly not what we understand by any personal god. Not a god endowed with specific attributes of humanity, not even, and here we find a remarkable anticipation of Hegel, a conscious god. In other words, Tao transcends the illusory, unreal distinctions by which all human systems of morality depend, for in it, all virtues and vices coalesce into one. The Christian takes a different view altogether. He prefers to ignore the facts which nature shows him, or he may read them in an arbitrary or one-sided manner. This god of his, if no longer anthropomorphic, is undeniably anthropopathic. He is a personal deity, now loving and merciful, now irascible and jealous. A deity who is open to prayer and entreaty. With all the qualities such as these, it is difficult to see how he can be regarded, this god, as anything but a glorified man. Which of these two views, the Taoist or the Christian, it is best to hold for mankind, may be a matter of dispute. However, there can be no doubt which is more logical. The weakness of Taoism lies in its application to the conduct of life. Lao Tzu was not content to be a metaphysician merely. He aspired to be a good practical reformer as well. It was man's business, he thought, to model himself as closely as possible on the great exemplar, Tao. It follows as the manner, of course, that the precepts were mostly in a negative order, and we are led straight into the doctrine of passivity or inaction, Wu Wei, 
which was bound to be fatally misunderstood and easily perverted. Lao Tzu's teaching has reached us, if not in its original form, yet much of it in its native purity, in the Tao Te Ching. One of the most potent arguments for the high antiquity of the marvelous little treatise is that it shows no decided trace of the corruption which is discernible in the second of our periods. Represented for us by the writings of Liu Tzu and Chuang Tzu, I have called it the period of development, because of the extraordinary quickening and blossoming of the buds of Lao Tzu's thought in the supple and imaginative minds of these two philosophers. The cancer, alas, is already in the heart of the flower, but so rich in luxuriance is the feast of color before us that we hardly notice it yet. Very little is known of our author beyond what he tells us, his full name, Liu Yuko, and it appears to be living in the Cheng state not long before the year 398 BC, when the Prime Minister, Su Yang, was killed in a revolution. He figures prominently in the pages of Chuang Tzu, from whom we learn that he could ride the wind. He is thus depicted in the design of the cover of this volume, taken from an illustrated work on ink tablets. On the insufficient ground that he is not mentioned by the historian, Su Ma Chen, a certain critic of the Song Dynasty, was led to declare that Li Yuko was only a fictitious personage, invented by Chuang Tzu and that the treatise which passes under his name was a forgery from later times. This theory is rejected by the compilers of the great catalogue of Qian Lung's library, who represent the cream of Chinese scholarship in the 18th century. One may notice, in fact, that Li Yuko and Chuang Tzu both take very different views of Confucius, which alone makes it very difficult to say that Li Yuko is just a forgery of Chuang Tzu, who takes a very different negative view of Confucius. Although Lei Yuko's work has evidently passed through the hands of many editors and gathered numerous editions, there remains a considerable nucleus which is all probably committed by the writing of Lei Yuko's immediate disciples, and is therefore older than the genuine part of the Tuangzu. There are some obvious analogies between the two authors, and indeed a certain number of matter common to both, but on the whole, Lei Yuko's book bears an unmistakable impress of its own. The geniality of its tone contrasts with the somewhat hard brilliancy of the Tuangzu and a certain kindly sympathy with the aged, the poor, and the humble of this life, not including the brute creation, makes itself felt throughout. The opposition between Taoism and Confucianism is not so sharp as we find in the Chuangzu, and Confucius himself is treated with much greater respect. This alone is strong evidence in favor of the priority of Li Yuko, and there is no doubt that the breach between the two systems widened as time went on. Li Yuko's work is about half as long as the Chuangzu, and is divided into many books. Nearly all of the Taoist writers are fond of parables and allegorical tales, but none of them is this branch of literature brought to such perfection as in Liu Tzu, who surpasses Chuangzu himself as the master of anecdote. His stories are almost invariably pithy and pointed. Many of them invents not only a keen sense of dramatic effect, but a real instinct into human nature. Others may appear fantastic and somewhat wildly imaginative. The story of the man issued from solid rock is typically of one of this class. It ends, however, with a streak of ironical humor, which may lead us to doubt whether Li Yuko himself really believed that possibility of transcending natural laws. Perhaps the best solution of the problem is the theory I have already mentioned, and that Liu Tzu, which we now possess, while containing a solid and authentic core of the master's own teachings, has been overlaid with much of the decadent Taoism of the age that followed. Of the third period, little actually needs to be said here. It is represented in literature by the lengthy treatise of Huai Nan Tzu, the spurious episodes in Liu Tzu and Chuang Tzu, and the host of minor writers, some of whom tried to pass off their works as the genuine relics of ancient sages. Chang Chen, an officer in the banqueting court under the Eastern Qin Dynasty, roughly 4th century AD, is an author of the best commentary on the Liu Tzu. Extracts from it, placed between inverted commas, will be found throughout the following pages. In the time of Chang Chen, although Taoism as a philosophical system has long run its course, its development into the national religion was just only then beginning and subsequent influence on literature and art is hardly to be overestimated. It has supplied the elements of mystery, romance, and color, which are needed as a set-off against the uncompromising stiffness and conservatism of the Confucian ideal. For reviving and incorporating in itself the floating mass of folklore and mythology, which has come down from the earliest of ages, as well as for the many exquisite creations of its own fancy, this book deserves the lasting gratitude of the Chinese people. Book 1, Celestial Signs and Cosmogony Our master, Li Yuko, dwelt on a vegetable plot in the Cheng state for 40 years, and no man knew him for what he was. 
The prince and his ministers and the state officials looked upon him as though of the common herd. A time of dearth fell upon the state, and he was beginning to migrate to Wei, when his disciples said to him, Now that our master is going away without the prospect of returning, we have ventured to approach you, hoping for instruction. Are there no words from the lips of Hu Chu Sulin that you can impart on us? Li Yuko smiled and said, Do you suppose that Hu Chu dealt in words? However, I will try to repeat to you what my master said to me on one occasion on Po Hun Mojen. I was standing by and heard his words, which ran as follows. There is a creative principle which itself is uncreated. There is a principle of change which itself is unchanging. The uncreated is able to create life. The unchanging is able to affect change. That which is producing cannot but continue producing, and that which is evolving cannot but continue to evolve. Hence, there is constant production and constant evolution. The constant law of constant production and of constant evolution at no time ceases to operate. The commentator Chang Chen says, That which is once involved in the destiny of living things can never be annihilated. Continuing, So it is with the yin and yang, so it is with the four seasons. The yin and yang are the positive and negative principles of nature, alternating predominantly by day and night. The creation which we surmise to be alone in itself. The supreme, the non-engendered, how can its reality be proven? We can only suppose that it is a mysterious one, without beginning and without end. The unchanging goes to and fro, and its range illimitable. We may surmise that it stands alone, and its ways are inexhaustible. In the Book of the Yellow Emperor it is written, The spirit of the valley dies not, but it can be called the mysterious feminine. The issuing point of the mysterious feminine must be regarded as the root of the universe, subsisting on all eternity, it uses its force without effort. The Book of the Yellow Emperor is no longer extant, but the above passage is now incorporated into the Tao Te Ching and is attributed to Lao Tzu. That then, which engenders all things, itself is unengendered. That by which all things are evolved is itself untouched by evolution. Self-engendering and self-evolved, it is itself the elements of subsistence, appearance, wisdom, strength, dispersion, and cessation. Yet it would be a mistake to call it by any of these names. The master Liet Tzu said, The inspired men of old regarded the yin and yang as controlling the sum total of heaven and earth. How is it then that that which has substance is formed from that which is devoid of substance? Then what is the origin of heaven and earth? They were engendered out of nothing and came to existence of themselves. Hence we say, there is a great principle of change, a great origin, a great beginning, a great primordial simplicity. In the great change, substance is not yet maintained. In the great origin lies the beginning of substance. In the great beginning lies the beginning of material form. After the separation of yin and yang, when classes of object assumed their forms, in the great simplicity lies the beginning and essential qualities, when substance, form, and essential qualities are still indistinguishably blended together, it is called chaos. Chaos means that things are chaotically intermixed and not yet separated from another. The purer and lighter elements, tending upwards, made up the heavens. The grosser, duller, and heavier elements, tending downwards, made the earth. Substance, harmoniously proportioned, became man, heaven, and earth, containing thus the spiritual element that all things were evolved and produced. The master Liet Tzu said, The virtue of heaven and earth, and the powers of the sage, and the usage of the myriad things in creation, are not yet perfect in every direction. It is heaven's function to produce life, and to spread a canopy over it. It is earth's function to form material bodies and to support them. It is the sage's function to teach others and to influence them for good. It is the function of created things to conform to their proper nature. That being so, there are things which earth may excel, Though they lie outside the scope of heaven, matters in which the sage has no concern, though they afford free play to others, it is clear that that which imparts life and broods over life cannot form and supports material bodies, and that which forms and supports material bodies cannot teach and influence for good. One who teaches and influences for good run counter to natural instincts. That which is formed in suitable environment does not travel outside its own sphere. Therefore, the way of heaven and earth is either of the yin or the yang. The teaching of the sage will either be of altruism or of righteousness. The quality of created objects will either be of soft or of hard. All these conform to their proper nature and can never depart from that province assigned to them. On one hand, there is life, and on the other, there is that which produces life. 
There is form, and that which imparts form. There is sound, and that which causes sound. There is color, and that which causes color. There is taste, and that which evokes taste. Things that have been endowed with life die, but that which produces life itself never dies. The origin of form is matter, but that which imparts form has no material existence. The genesis of sound lies in the sense of hearing, but that which causes sound is never audible to the ear. The source of color is vision, but that which produces color never manifests itself to our eyes. The origin of taste lies in the tongue, but that which causes taste is never perceived by that sense. All these phenomena are functions of the state of inaction. Wu Wei, inaction, here stands for the inert, unchanging Tao. To be at will, either bright or obscure, soft or hard, short or long, round or square, alive or dead, hot or cold, buoyant or sinking, stiff or pliable, treble or base, present or absent, black or white, bitter or sweet, fetid or fragrant, that is to be devoid of knowledge, yet all-knowing, without power, yet all-powerful, such as Tao. Continuing, on his journey to Wei, Master Li Zhu took a meal on the roadside. His followers espied an old skull and pulled aside the undergrowth to show it to him. Turning to his disciple, Po Feng, the master said, That skull and I both know that there is no such thing as absolute life or absolute death. If we regard ourselves as passing above the road of evolution, then I am alive and he is dead. But looked at it from the standpoint of Tao, there is no principle of life itself. It follows that there then can be no such principle as death. This knowledge is better than all your methods of prolonging life, and a more potent source of happiness than any other. In the Book of the Yellow Emperor, it is written, When form becomes active, it produces not form, but shadow. When sound becomes active, it produces not sound, but echo. When not becoming becomes active, it does not produce not being, but being. Form is something that must come to an end. Heaven and earth, then, have an end, even as we all have an end. But whether that end is complete, we do not know. When there is conglomeration, form comes into being. When there is dispersion, it comes to an end. That is what we mortals mean by beginning an end. But although for us, in a state of conglomeration, this condensed into form constitutes a being, and its dispersion an end. And from the standpoint of dispersion, it is void and calm that constitute the being, and condensation into form, the end. Hence, there is perpetual alteration in what constitutes time and end, and the underlying truth is that there is neither any beginning at all, nor any possible end. The course of evolution ends where it started, without a beginning. It finishes up where it began, in not being. This is a paradoxical way of saying that there is no beginning and no end, or not beginning and not ending. That which has life again returns to the lifeless, which again has form returns to the formless. This, that I call the lifeless, is not the original lifelessness. This, that I call the formless, is not original formlessness. That which I have termed the lifeless has formerly possessed life, and subsequently passed into the extinction of death, whereas the original lifelessness from the beginning knows neither life nor extinction. We have again here the distinction between the unchanging life-giving principle, Tao, which is itself without life, and the living things themselves, which are in constant flux between life and death. That which has life must by the law of its being come to an end, and that end can no more be avoided than a living creature can help but being born, so that he who hopes to perpetuate his life or to shut out death is deceived as to his destiny. The spiritual element in man is allotted to him by heaven, this corporeal frame by earth. The part which belongs to heaven is ethereal and dispersive. The part that belong to earth is dense and tending towards conglomeration. When the spirit parts from the body, each of these elements resumes to its true nature. That is why, when men die, their disimparting spirits are called kue, which means returning, that is, returning to their true place of dwelling, the region of the great void. The Yellow Emperor said, If my spirit returns through the gates whence it came, and my bones go back to the source from which they sprang, where then does the ego continue to exist? Between his birth and his latter end, man passes through four chief stages, infancy, adolescence, old age, and death. In infancy, 
The vital force is concentrated, the will is undivided, and the general harmony of the system is perfect. External objects produce no injurious impression, and to the moral nature nothing can be added. In adolescence, the animal passions are wildly exuberant. The heart is filled with rising passions and preoccupations. The man is open to attack by the objects of sense, and thus his moral nature becomes enfeebled. In old age, his desires and preoccupation have lost their keenness, and the bodily frame seeks for repose. External objects, to him, no longer hold a place of his regard. In this state, though not attaining the perfection of infancy, he is already different from what was in adolescence. In death, he comes to rest, and rests in the absolute. Confucius was traveling once over Mount Tai, when he caught the sight of an aged man roaming in the fields. The man was clothed in a deer skin, girded with a rope, and was singing while he played on a lute. My friend, said Confucius, what is it that makes you so happy? The old man replied, I have a great deal to make me happy. Heaven and earth created all things. In all these creations, man is the noblest. It has fallen to my lot to be a man, and it is my first ground for happiness. And there is distinction between male and female. The former, well, being more highly rated than the latter. Therefore, it's better to be a man. And since I am one, I have a second ground for happiness. Furthermore, some are born who never behold the sun and the moon, or who never emerge from their swaddling clothes as a baby. But I have already walked this earth for a space of 90 years, and for this is my third ground for happiness. Poverty is the normal lot of a scholar. Death, the appointed end of all beings. Abiding in that natural state, and reaching at last the appointed end? What is then that should make me unhappy? What an excellent thing it is, cried Confucius, to be able to find a source of consolation of oneself in oneself. Lin Lai was nearly a hundred years old. In spring he put on a leather coat and gleaned the harvest fields, singing as he went along. When Confucius traveled to the fields, he saw him. Turning to his disciples, he said, That man is worth talking to. Let's try to ask him something. Ji Gong requested permission to go. Catching up with him at the edge of the field, he faced the old man and said in a tone of lament, Have you no regrets? That you can go along singing and gleaning in a field? Lin Lai went right on without stopping, singing all the while. Ji Gong kept up after him. So he looked and answered, What have I to regret? Ji Gong said, you didn't work hard when you were young. You didn't compete with your generation as you matured. You're growing too old with no wife and no child, and you're going to die soon. What kind of happiness could you have that you sing as you work in a field? Lin Lai laughed and said, The reasons for my happiness are available to everyone, but they take for them misery instead. The fact that I didn't work hard when I was young and didn't compete with contemporaries as I matured is why I lived so long. The fact I'm growing old without a wife or a child, and I'm soon going to die, is why I can be so happy. Ji Gong said, Long life is a human desire, and people detest death. How can you enjoy dying? The old man Lin Lai said, Death and birth are a round trip, so when I die here, how do I know I won't be born elsewhere? So how do I know they're not equivalent? And how do I know it's not a delusion to strive for life? And how do I know now? that my death will not be better than my life in the past. Ji Gong didn't understand what Lin Lai said, so he went back and told Confucius. Confucius said, I knew he was worth talking to, and he was. However, his merit was not consummated by you, Ji Gong. Su Kung was tired of study, and confided his feelings to Confucius, saying, I yearn for rest. And Confucius replied, In life there is no rest. To toil, in anxious planning for the future, to slave in bolstering up the bodily frame, these are the businesses of life. Is rest, then, nowhere to be found? Oh yes, replied Confucius. Look at all the graves in the wild, all the vaults, all the tombs, and all the funeral urns with the ashes of the ancestors, and you then may know where rest is found. Great indeed is death, claimed Zhu Kong. It gives rest to the noble-hearted and causes the base to cower. You are right, said Confucius. Men feel the joy of life, but do not realize its bitterness. They feel the weariness of old age, but not its peacefulness. They think of the evils of death, but not of the repose it confers. Yen Su said, How excellent was the ancients' view of death, bringing rest to the good and subjugation to the wicked. Death 
then, is the boundary line of virtue. That is, death abolishes all artificial and temporary distinctions between good and evil, which only hold good in this world in relativity. The ancients spoke of the dead as que gen, men who have returned. But if the dead are men who have returned, the living men are on a journey. Those who are on a journey and not think of returning have cut themselves off from their home. Should any one man cut himself off from his home, he would incur universal reprobation and disgust. When all mankind being homeless, there is no one to see the error. Imagine one lives in a kind of native village, separates himself from his kith and kin, dissipates his patrimony, and wanders off to the four corners of the earth, never again to return. You may ask, what manner of man is this to give up all things? The world will surely set him down as a profligate, a vagabond, and a bastard. On the other hand, imagine one who clings to responsibility and respectability and all the things of life, holds cleverness and capacity in high esteem, builds himself up a reputation, and plays the braggart amongst his fellow men, without knowing where to stop. What then manner of man once more is he? The world will surely look upon this gentleman, so he is, as a great source of wisdom and counsel. Both of these men, in actuality, have lost their way. Yet the world will consort with one, but not the other. Only the sage knows who to consort and whom to hold aloof. He consorts with those who regard life and death merely as waking and sleeping, and holds apart from him, far away, those who are steeped in forgetfulness of their own return. One must, then, always remember their return. Someone asked Master Lai, Why do you esteem emptiness? Master Lai said, Well, emptiness has no esteem. Master Lai then said, It's not like the name. There's nothing like quietude, nothing like emptiness. By quietude and emptiness, you find your home. By taking and giving, you lose your place. When there is fanfare about benevolence and duty, only after things have been ruined, there is no possibility, then, for restoration. Yu Sung said, Evolution is never-ending, but who can perceive the great secret process of heaven and earth? Thus, things are diminished here, are augmented there. Things that are made whole in one place suffer loss in another. Diminution and augmentation, fullness and decay, are the constant accompaniments of life and death. They alterate in continuous succession, and we are not conscious of any interval. The whole body of spiritual substance progresses without a pause. The whole body of material substance suffers decay without intermission. But we do not perceive the process of completion, nor do we perceive the process of decay. Man, likewise, from birth to old age, becomes something different in every day in face and form, in wisdom and conduct, his skin, his nails, his hair, are all continually growing and continually perishing. In infancy and childhood, there is no stopping, no respite from change. Though hard to see while it's going on, it may be verified afterwards, if, of course, you can see it. There was once a man of the Qi state, who was so afraid of the universe that it would collapse and fall to pieces, leaving his body without a home, that he could neither sleep nor eat. Another man, pitying his friend's distress, went to enlighten him. Heaven, he said, is nothing more than an accumulation of ether, and there is no place where ether is not. Processes of contraction and expansion, inspiration and exhalation, are continually taking place up there in the heavens. Why then should you be afraid that they collapse down on you? The man said, It is true that heaven is accumulation of ether, but the sun and moon and the stars, will they not fall down upon us? This informant replied, Sun and moon and stars are likewise only bright lights within this mass of ether. Even supposing they were to fall, they could not possibly harm us by their impact. But what if the earth should fall to pieces? The earth, replied the other, is merely the conglomeration of matter, which fills up and blocks up the four corners of space. There is no part of it where matter is not. All day long there is the constant treading and trampling on the surface of the earth. Why then should you be afraid of its falling to pieces? Thereupon, the man was relieved of his fears, and rejoiced excitedly, and his instructor was also joyful and easy of mind. But then, Chang Lu Su laughed at both of them, saying, Rainbows and clouds and mist and wind and rain in the four seasons, these are all perfected forms of accumulated ether, and go on up to make the heavens. Mountains and cliffs, rivers and seas, metals and rocks, fire and timber, these are all perfected forms of agglomerated matter, and constitute the earth. 
Knowing these facts, who can say that they will never be destroyed? Heaven and Earth form only a small speck in the midst of the void, but they are the greatest things in the sum of being. This much is certain. Even as their nature is hard to fathom, hard to understand, so they will be slow to pass away, slow to come to an end. He who fears, lest they should suddenly fall to pieces, is assuredly very far from the truth. He, on the other hand, who says that they will never be destroyed, has also not reached the right conclusion. Heaven and earth, of necessity, pass away, but neither will revert to destruction apart from the other. The speaker then means that there is no immediate danger of a collapse. It is certain, though, that our universe must obey the natural law of disintegration, or entropy, and at the constant distant date disappear altogether, but the process of decay will be so gradual to the life of a man that it will be imperceptible. Who, having to face the day of disruption, will not be alarmed? Master Lietsu heard of the discussion, and smiled and said, He who maintains that heaven and earth are destructible, and he who upholds the contrary, are both equally at fault. The fact of the matter is, whether they are destructible or not, is something we can never know, though in both cases it will be the same for all alike. The living and the dead, the going and the coming, know nothing of each other's true state. Whether destruction awaits from the world or no, why should I ever trouble my head about it? Shun asked an assistant, can Tao be possessed? He said, Even your body is not in your possession. How can you possess the Tao? Shun said, If my body is not my possession, who owns it? He said, It is the form entrusted by the universe. Life is not our possession. It is the harmony entrusted by the universe. Nature and destiny are not your possessions either. They are order entrusted by the universe. Progeny are not your possessions. They are shells entrusted by the universe. Therefore, we go without knowing where, abide without knowing what to keep, eat without knowing what to consume. The powerful positivity of the universe is energy. How can that be possessed? Mr. Kuo of the Qi state was very rich, while Mr. Xiang of the Sung state was very poor. Mr. Shang traveled from Sung to Qi and asked Mr. Kuo what the secret for prosperity was. Mr. Kuo told him, It's because I'm a good thief, he said. The first year I began being a thief, I had just enough. The second year, I had ample. The third year, I had a great harvest. And in the course of time, I found myself the owner of whole villages and districts. Mr. Shang was overjoyed. He understood the word thief in only its literal sense, but he did not understand the true way of becoming a thief. Accordingly, Mr. Shang climbed over walls and broke into houses, grabbing everything he could see or lay his hands upon. But before very long, his thefts brought about him great trouble, and he was stripped of even what he had previously possessed without theft. Thinking Mr. Kuo had basely deceived him, Mr. Shang went to him with bitter complaint. Now tell me, Mr. Kuo, how did you set about being a thief? On learning from Mr. Shang what had actually happened, he cried out, Alas, you have been brought to this pass because you were wrong in your way of work. Now let me put you on a right track. We all know that heaven has its seasons, and that earth has its riches. Well, the things that I steal are the riches of heaven and earth, each in their season. The fertilizing rainwater from the clouds, the natural products of mountain and meadowland. Thus, I grow my grain and ripen my crops, build my walls and construct my homes. From the dry land, I steal winged and four-footed game. From the rivers, I can steal fish and turtles. There is nothing I do that I do not steal. For corn and grain, clay and wood, birds and beasts, fish and turtles are all products of nature. So how can I claim them as mine? Yet, stealing in this way from nature, I bring on myself no retribution and break no laws, but gold, jade, precious stones, stores of grain, silk, and other kinds of property are all accumulated by men, not bestowed on us by nature. So who can complain if he gets in trouble by stealing them? Mr. Shang, in a state of great perplexity and fearing to be led astray a second time by Mr. Kuo, went off to consult Mr. Tung, a man of great learning. Mr. Tung said to Mr. Shang, are you not already a thief in respect to your own body? You're stealing the harmony of yin and yang in order to keep alive and maintain your bodily form. How much more, then, are you a thief with regard to external possessions? Assuredly, heaven and earth cannot be dislocated from the myriad of objects of nature. To claim any one of these as your own betokens confusion of thought. Mr. Kuo's theft are carried out in the spirit of justice, and therefore bring no retribution and break no laws. But your theft were carried out in the spirit of self-seeking, and landed you in so much trouble. Those who take possession of property, whether public or private, are thieves. 
By taking possession of public property, as we have seen, Li Yuko means utilizing the products of nature are open to all, rain and the like. Those who abstain from taking property, public or private, are still thieves. We are all thieves of nature. For no one can help possessing a body, and no one can help acquiring some property or other which cannot be got rid of with the best will in the world. Such thefts are unconscious thefts. The great principle of heaven and earth is to treat public property as such, and private property as such. Knowing this principle, which of us is a thief, and at the same time, which of us is not a thief? Book 2 of the Liet Tzu, The Yellow Emperor The Yellow Emperor sat for fifteen years on the throne, and rejoiced that the empire looked to him as its head. He was careful of his physical well-being, sought pleasures for his ears and eyes, and gratified his senses of smell and taste. Nevertheless, he grew melancholy in spirit, his complexion began to sallow, and his sensations became dull and confused. Then, for a further period of fifteen years, he grieved that the empire was in disorder. He summoned up all of his intelligence, exhausted his resources of wisdom and strength in trying to rule the people. But, in spite of it all, his face remained haggard and pale, and his sensations dulled and confused. The practice of enlightened virtue will not succeed in establishing good government, but only disorganize the spiritual faculties. Then, the Yellow Emperor sighed heavily and said, My fault is want of moderation. The misery I suffer comes from my over-attention to my own self, and the troubles of the Empire from over-regulation in everything. Thereupon, he threw out all of his schemes, abandoned his ancestral palace, dismissed all of his attendants and servants, and removed all of the hanging bells, cut down on the delicacies of his cuisine, and retired to live at leisure in private apartments attached to the court. There, he fasted in heart, and brought his body under control. For three months, he abstained from personal intervention in government, and he fell asleep in the daytime, and dreamed that he made a journey to the kingdom of Huatsu, situated in I don't know how many tens of thousands of miles distance from the Qi state. It was beyond the reach of any ship or vehicle, or any mortal foot. Only the soul can travel so far. The kingdom was without a head or ruler. It simply went on on itself. Its people there were without desires or cravings. They simply followed their natural instincts. They felt neither joy in life, nor abhorrence of death. Thus, they came to no untimely ends. They never felt attachment to self, nor indifference to others. Thus, they were exempt from love and hatred. They knew neither aversion from one course, nor inclination to another. To them, profit and loss existed to no one. All were equally untouched by the emotions of love and sympathy, of jealousy or fear. Water had no power to drown them, or fire had no power to burn them. Cuts and blows caused them neither injury or pain. Scratching or tickling could not make them itch. They bestrode the air as though treading on solid earth. There they cradled in space as though resting in a bed. Clouds and mist obstructed not their vision, thunder peals could not stun their eyes, physical beauty disturbed not their hearts, and mountains and valleys hindered not their steps. They moved about like many gods. When the Yellow Emperor awoke from his dream, he summoned up three ministers and told them what he had seen. For three months, he said, I have been living a life of leisure, fasting in heart, subduing my body, and casting all about in my mind of the true method of nourishing my own life and regulating the lives of others, but I have failed to discover any secret. It is wrong to nourish one's own life, wrong to regulate that of others. No attempt to do this by the light of intelligence can be successful. Worn out, I fell asleep and dreamed this dream. Now I know that the perfect Tao is not to be sought through senses, this Tao that I know and hold within me, yet I cannot impart it to you. If the Tao cannot be sought through the senses, it cannot be communicated through the senses. For 28 years after this, there was a great orderliness in his empire, nearly equaling that of the kingdom of Huatsu that he saw in his dreams. And when the emperor ascended on high, the people bewailed him for 2,000 years without intermission. There is a mountain on an island in an ocean current, where there are spiritual people who ingest air and dew instead of grain. Their minds are like deep springs, their bodies like virgin girls. They have no familiars or intimates. Immortals and sages are their subjects. They do not intimidate and do not get angry. Eager and earnest are their servants. They give no charity, yet everyone has enough. They do not accumulate or save, yet everyone has no lack. Yin and Yang are always in harmony. 
sun and moon are always clear. The four seasons are always regular. Wind and rain are always even. Nursing is always timely. Crops are always abundant. There is no plague, no early death among these people. No pestilence among the animals, and no apparitions of ghosts. Lie Tzu had Lao Shang for his teacher, and Po Kao Tzu for his friend. When he fully mastered the system of these two philosophers, he rode home again on the wings of the wind. Yin Shang heard of this, and became his disciple. He dwelt with Lie Tzu for many months without visiting his own home. While he was with him, he begged to be initiated into his esoteric arts. Ten times Yin Shang asked this, and each time he received no answer. Becoming impatient, Yin Shang announced his departure, but Lie Tzu still gave no sign. So Yin Shang went away, but after many months his mind was still unsettled, so he returned and became Lie Tzu's follower once more. Lie Tzu said to him, Why this incessant coming and going? Yin Shang replied, Some time ago, I sought instruction from you, but you would not tell me anything. That made me very annoyed with you. But now I have got rid of that feeling, and so I have come again. Lie Tzu said, Formerly, I used to think that you were a man of penetrating insight, and now you've fallen so low? Sit down, and I will tell you what I have learned from my master. After I had served him, and enjoyed the friendship of Po Kao, for the space of three years, my mind did not venture to reflect on right and wrong, my lips did not venture to speak of profit and loss, and then, for the first time, my master bestowed one glance upon me, and that was all. To be in reality entertaining the ideas of profit and loss, though without venturing to utter them, in the case of hiding one's resentment and harboring secret passions, hence a mere glance was condescending. At the end of five years a change had taken place. My mind was reflecting on right and wrong. My lips were speaking of profit and loss. Then, for the first time, my master relaxed his countenance and smiled. Right and wrong, profit and loss are fixed principles prevailing in the world of sense. To let the mind reflect on what it will, to let the lips utter what they please, and to not begrudgingly bottle it up all in one's breast, so that the internal and external may become as one, is still not so good as passing beyond the bounds of self and abstaining from all manifestation. This first step, however, pleased the master, and caused him to give me a smile. At the end of seven years there was another change. I let my mind reflect on what it would, but it would no longer occupy itself with right and wrong. I let my lips utter whatsoever they pleased, but they no longer spoke of profit and loss. Then, at last, my master let me in to sit on a mat beside him. The question is, how to bring the mind to a state of calm, in which there is no thinking or mental activity? How to keep the lips silent, with only natural inhalation and exhalation going on? If you give yourself up to mental perfection, right and wrong will cease to exist. If the lips are following their natural law, they know not profit or loss. Their ways agreeing, master and friend sat side by side with him on the same seat, the way that it should be. At the end of nine years, my mind gave free rein on its reflections. My mouth had free passage of its speech. Of right and wrong, profit and loss, I had no knowledge at all, either as touching myself or others. I know neither that the master was my instructor, nor that the other man was my friend. Internal and external blended into one unity. After that, there was no distinction between eye and ear, ear and nose, nose and mouth. All were the same to me. My mind was frozen. My body was dissolute. My flesh and bones all melted together to one. I was wholly unconscious what my body was resting on, or what was under my feet. I was born this way and that on the wind, like dry chaff or leaves falling from a tree. In fact, I knew not whether the wind was riding on me, or I on the wind. Now, you have not spent one whole season in your teacher's house, and yet you have lost patience for two or three times already. Why, at this rate, the atmosphere will never support a morsel of your body, and even an earth will be unequal to the weight of one of your limbs. The only way to etherealize the body being to purge the mind of its passions. So how can you expect to walk in the void or be charioted on the wind? Hearing this, the low Yin Shang was deeply ashamed. He could hardly trust himself to breathe, and it was a long time before he ventured to utter another word to Lie Tzu. Lie Tzu asked the keeper of the pass, Complete people can travel underwater without obstruction, walk on fire without being burnt, and can go beyond all things without fear. How do they get to be this way? The keeper of the pass said, There is protection of pure energy, not the kind with cunning and cleverness, resolute and daring. Stay a while, and I'll tell you. Whatever has appearance, form, sound, or color is a thing. How can things be so disparate, and which of them can take precedence, when there are only forms? 
Things are created in the formless, and in the end unalterable. How can any who plumb this stop here? They live by measures without excess, take refuge in beginningless order, roam where things begin and end. They unify their essence, nurture their energy, and store their power, to commune with the creation of things. When they are like this, their nature is kept whole, their spirit has no gaps. How can anything get access to them? The keeper of the past said, When a drunken man falls from a cart, he may get hurt, but he does not die. His bones and joints are the same as other people's, but his injury is different from others because his spirit is whole. He doesn't know when he's riding. He doesn't know when he's falling either. Neither life nor death, surprise or fear, enter his heart. So he is not frightened when he encounters things. If even one who gains wholeness in wine is like this, how about one who gains wholeness in nature? The sage takes refuge in nature, so things cannot harm them. Master Li Yu Ko performs some archery for an elder known as Witless Nobody. Drawing the bow fully with a cup of water on his arm, he shot one arrow after another with continuous succession, and still as a statue all the while. The elder Witless Nobody said, This is deliberate shooting, not spontaneous shooting. Suppose you climbed a high mountain and stood on a precipice overlooking an abyss. Could you still shoot? So they climbed a high mountain, where Elder Witless Nobody went out on a precipice, standing with his back to the abyss, heels hanging off the ledge. He beckoned Li Yuko to join him. Yuko fell prostrate on the ground, running with sweat. Elder Witless Nobody said, Complete people gaze into the blue sky above, plunge into the center of the earth below, and run freely in the eight directions without even a change in mood. Now you have a fearful expression of aversion. Your inner state must be very uneasy. Mr. Fan had a son named Su Hua, who succeeded in achieving great fame as an exponent of the black arts, and when the whole kingdom bowed before him, he was in high favor with the Prince of Qin. Taking no office but standing on a par of the three ministers of state, any one of whom he turned his partial eye was marked out for distinction, while those who he speaked unfavorably were forthwith banished. People gathered in his hall in the same way as they went to court. Zhu Hua used to encourage his followers to contend amongst themselves, so that the clever ones were always bullying the slow-witted, and the strong always riding roughshod over the weak. Through this resulted in blows and wounds being dealt before his eyes, he was not in the habit of troubling about it. Day and night, this sort of thing served as his amusement, and practically became a custom in his state. One day, Ho Sheng, Tzu Po, two of Fan's leading disciples, set out on a journey, and after traversing a stretch of wild territory, they put up for a night in a hut of an old peasant named Shang Chu Wai. During the night, the two travelers conversed together, speaking of Zhu Hua's reputation and influence, his power over life and death, and how they could make a rich man poor and a poor man rich. Now, old man Shang Chu Huai was living on the border of starvation. He had crept around the window and overheard the conversation. Accordingly, he borrowed some provisions and, shouldering his basket, set off for Zhu Hua's establishment. This man's followers, however, were of a worldly set. They wore silken garments and rode in high carriages and stalked about with their noses in the air. Seeing old Shang Chu Wai was a weak old man who had a weather beaten face and clothes of no real particular cut, they one and all despised him, for he was poor. Soon, the old man became a regular target for their insults and ridicule. He was hustled about, slapped on the back, and whatnot. Shang Chu Huai, however, never showed the least annoyance, and at last the disciples, having exhausted their wit on him this way, grew tired of the fun. So, by way of a joke, they took the old man to the top of a cliff, and word was passed around that whosoever dared to throw himself over the cliff would be rewarded with a hundred ounces of silver. There was an eager response, and Shang Chu Wai, in perfect good faith, was the first to leap over the edge. And lo, he was wafted down to the earth like a bird on the wing. Not a bone or muscle in his body was hurt. Mr. Fawn's disciples, regarding this as merely a lucky chance, were surprised, but not yet moved to great wonder. When they pointed to a bend in a foaming river below, saying, There's a precious pearl at the bottom of that river, which is to be had for the diving, Shang Chu Wai again acted on their suggestion, and plunged in. Time passed, and when he came out, sure enough, he held a giant pearl in his hand. Then, at last, the whole company began to suspect a truth. Su Hua gave orders that an array of costly food offerings and silken raiment should be prepared. A great fire was kindled around the pile of gifts. If you can walk through the midst of these flames, he said, you're welcome to keep what you can get of these embroidered stuffs, be it little or much, as a great reward. 
Without moving a muscle in his face, Shang Chu Huai walked straight into the fire, and came back again with his garments unsoiled and his body unsinged. Mr. Fan and his disciples now realized that he was one with the Tao, and all began to make their apologies. They said, We did not know, sir, that you were so aligned with the Tao. We were only playing tricks on you. We insulted you, not knowing that you were a divine man. You, sir, have exposed our stupidity, our deafness, and our blindness. May we venture to ask what your great secret is? Secret, replied Chang Chu Huai. I have none. Even in my own mind, I have no clue as to the real cause. Nevertheless, there is one point in it all which I should try to explain to you, young ones. A short time ago, sir, two disciples of yours came and put up tonight in my hut. I heard them extolling Mr. Fawn's powers, how he could dispense life and death at his will, how he was able to make a rich man poor and a poor man rich. I believed this, implicitly, and as the distance was not very great, I came hither. Having arrived, I unreservedly accepted as true all the statements made by your disciples, and was only afraid lest the opportunity might never come of putting them triumphantly to the proof. I knew not what part of space my body had occupied, nor yet the danger lurked. My mind was simply at one, and material objects offered no resistance. That is all. But now, having discovered that your disciples were merely deceiving me, my inner mind is thrown into a state of doubt and perplexity, while outwardly, my senses of sight and hearing reassert themselves, unfortunately. When I reflect now that I have just escaped being drowned, burned, and crushed to death, my heart within me freezes with horror, and my limbs tremble with fear. I shall never again have courage to go near fire or water. From that time forth, when Mr. Fawn's disciple happened to meet a beggar or a poor horse doctor on the road, so far from jeering at him, they would actually dismount and offer him a humble bow. Mr. Sai Huo heard this story and told it to Confucius. Confucius said, Is that so strange to you? was the reply. The man of perfect faith can extend his influence to inanimate objects and disembodied spirits. He can move beyond heaven and earth and fly in the six cardinal points without encountering any hindrance. His powers are not confined to walking in perilous places and passing through water and fire. If Shang Chu Wai, who put his faith in matters of falsehoods, found no obstacle in external matter, how much more certainly will that be, so when both parties are equally sincere? Young man, bear this in mind. In Shang Shu Hui's case, though he himself was sincere, Mr. Fan Su Hua was merely an imposter. The Keeper of Animals, under King Shun of the Zhou Dynasty, had an assistant named Liang Yang, who was skilled in the management of wild birds and beasts. When he fed them in their park enclosure, all the animals showed themselves tame and tractable. Although they comprised tigers, wolves, eagles, and ospreys, male and female propagated their kind, and their numbers multiplied. The difficulty of keeping wild animals to breed in captivity is well known to many naturalists. The differing species live promiscuously together, yet they never clawed or bit another. The king was afraid lest this man's secret should die with him, and commanded him to impart it to the keeper. So, Liang Yang appeared before the keeper, and said, I am only a humble servant, and have nothing really to impart. I fear this majesty thinks I'm hiding something from you. With regard to my method of feeding tigers, all I have to say is this. When yielded to, they are pleased. When opposed, they're angry. Such is the natural disposition of all living creatures. But neither their pleasure nor their anger is manifested without a cause. Both are really excited by opposition. Anger, directly. Pleasure, indirectly. Owing to the natural reaction when the opposite is overcome. In feeding tigers, then, I avoid giving them either live animals or whole carcasses, lest in their former case the act of killing, in the latter case the act of tearing them to pieces, should excite them to fury. I time their periods of hunger and repletion, and I gain a full understanding of their causes of anger. Tigers are of a different species from man, but, like man, they respond to those who coax them with food, and consequently, the act of killing their victims tends to provoke them greatly. This is so, I should not speak of opposing them, and thus provoking their anger. Nor do I humor them, and thus cause them to feel pleased. For this feeling of pleasure will, in time, be succeeded by anger. Just as anger must invariably be succeeded by pleasure, neither of these states hits the proper medium. Hence, it is my aim to be neither completely antagonistic nor compliant to the tigers. So then, the animals regard me as one of their own. Thus it happens then, that these tigers can walk about the park and neither regret the tall forests or the broad marshes that they live in, and rest in the enclosure without yearning for the lonely mountains and dark valleys. These are the principles which have led to the results you see. 
Yan Hui asked Confucius, I once crossed deep waters, and the ferryman handled the boat like a genius. I asked him if it was possible to learn to handle a boat. He said, yes, somebody who can swim can teach it, while somebody with the skill for swimming can do it soon. Somebody who can dive, however, can handle a boat right away without ever having seen one. I asked him about it, but he didn't answer. May I ask what that means? Confucius said, Alas, you and I have really only been long studying the letter without arriving at the substance. Is this really the way? The reason someone who can swim can teach it is he thinks little of the water. The reason someone with talent for swimming can soon do it is that he forgets the water. As for the diver who can handle a boat without ever having seen one before, he looks upon the abyss like dry land, regards the boat capsizing like a cart overturning. If everything were overturned right in front of you, yet that couldn't get to you, where would you not be at ease? When you gamble for a chip, you feel clever. When you gamble for your belt buckle, you get nervous. If you gamble for gold, you feel faint. You may have the same skill, but when you've got something to lose, then you care about the externals. Usually, those who care about externals are inept in regard to the inward. Confucius saw a waterfall of over 200 feet high, foaming for 10 miles. Turtles, crocodiles, fish, and even sea turtles couldn't swim there. He saw a man go swimming there, and thought it was someone in misery who just wanted to die. He sent a disciple to go downstream and fish the body out. The man emerged several hundred yards away, walking below the levee, singing as he went, his hair hanging loose. Confucius caught up to the man and said, That waterfall is over 200 feet high, and churns foam for 10 miles. Even sea turtles, crocodiles, fish, and fresh turtles can't swim there. When I saw you plunge in, I thought you were troubled and wanted to die so easily, so I sent a disciple to follow you downstream and find you. When I saw you come out, with your hair hanging low, singing as you went along, I thought you were a ghost. Now that I've gotten a good look at you, I find you're just a man. May I ask, do you have a way to walk on water? The man said, no, I have no way. I begin to think I was already there. Developed naturally. Succeeded my destiny. I go into the whirlpools and come out the torrents. I follow the way of the water, without imposing myself on it. This is how I go through it. Confucius asked, what does it mean to begin with what's already there? Develop naturally and succeed by destiny. The man said, I was born on land, and am at ease on land. That's why I'm already here. I grew up in water, and am comfortable in water. That's nature. I don't know why I am the way I am, but this is the order of life. When Confucius traveled to the state of Chu, he passed through a woods, where he saw a hunchback catching cicadas with a gummed stick as easily as picking them up with his hands. Confucius asked, Your skill, man! Are you aligned with the Tao? The man said, I have a way, for five or six months I'd stack clay balls, two without them falling, I'd miss but little. When I could stack three without them falling, I'd miss one out of ten. When I could stack five without them falling, then I could catch cicadas like picking them up. When I get set, I'm like a dead stump, while the arm I use to catch them is like the limb of a dead tree. However vast the universe, however many manifold myriad of things, I am only aware of the cicada's wings. I don't fidget, I don't take my attention off the cicada's wings for anything. How could I fail to catch it? Confucius turned to one of his disciples and said, When concentration is undivided, it's like genius. This saying seems to apply to the hunchback. The man said, You are a scholar. How can you even ask about this? Take care of your own business. Then we can talk about something higher. There once was a man, sailor by profession, who was very fond of seagulls. Every morning he went out into the sea and swam in their midst, at which times a hundred gulls or more would constantly flock around him. Creatures are not shy of those who they feel to be in mental and bodily harmony with themselves. One day, the man's father said to him, I'm told that the seagulls swim about you in the water. I wish you to catch one or two to make pets of. And the following day, the sailor went out to the sea as usual. But lo, the gulls only wheeled about in the air and would not come down to meet him. There was disturbance in his mind, accompanied by a change in his outward demeanor. The birds themselves became conscious of the fact that he was in fact a human being. How could their instinct ever be deceived? The Lord Chao Shang Su led out a company of a hundred thousand men to hunt in the central mountains of Zhongshan. Lighting the dry undergrowth, they set fire to the whole forest, and the glow of the flames was visible for a hundred miles around. 
Suddenly, a man appeared, emerging from a rocky cliff. That is to say, passing miraculously out of the stone itself. And he was seen to hover in the air amidst the flames and the smoke. Everybody believed him for a disembodied spirit. When the fire had passed, he walked quietly out, and showed no trace of having gone through the ordeal. Lord Shang Tzu marveled thereat, and detained him for the purpose of careful examination. In bodily form, he was undoubtedly just a man, possessing the seven channels of sense, besides which was breathing, and his voice proclaimed him to be a man. So, the prince inquired what secret power it was that allowed him to dwell in rock and walk through fire. What do you mean rock? replied the man. What do you mean fire? Shang Tzu said, Well, what you just came out of is rock. What you just walked out of is fire. Ah, I know nothing of them, replied the man. It was his extreme feat of unconsciousness that allowed him to perform these miraculous feats. This miraculous incident came to the ears of the Lord Wen of the Wei State. He spoke to his scholar Zhu Sha about it, saying, What an extraordinary man this must be. From what I have heard the master say, replied Zhu Sha, the man who achieves harmony with Tao enters to close union with external objects, and none of them has the power to hinder or harm him. As one passes through solid stone or metal, walking in the midst of fire or on the surface of water, all these things become possible to him. Why then, my friend, asked the Lord, can you not do all of this? I have not yet succeeded, said Zhu Xia, in cleansing my heart of impurities and discarding wisdom. I can only find leisure to discuss this matter in a merely tentative fashion. And why, pursued the Lord, does the Master himself perform these feats? The Master, then, replied Zhu Xia, is able to do these things, but he's also able to refrain from doing them. This answer delighted Lord Wen. A shaman named Ji Shan came from Qi to Cheng. He knew about people's death and birth, their survival and destruction, their calamity and misfortune, and whether people would live long or die young, predicting the year, month, and day like a spirit. When people in Cheng saw the shaman, they all ran away. Master Lia's mind was intoxicated on seeing him. He went back and told Master Pot Hill, I used to think your Tao supreme, but there is one even more perfect. Master Pot Hill said, I have only taught you the superficials. We haven't gotten to the substance yet. And you insist that you've attained the Tao? How can you get eggs from a bunch of hens with no rooster? When you pit the Tao against the world, that must yield information, thereby enabling someone to read you. Bring that shaman here and I'll show you. The next day, Master Lie took the shaman to see Master Pot Hill. When he came out, the shaman told Master Lie, Alas, your teacher is dying. He will not survive. He can't last a fortnight. I see something strange in him. I see wet ashes within him. Master Lie told Master Pot Hill, weeping profusely. The master said, I showed him the sign of earth, sprouting where there is no stirring and no stopping. So he only saw me shutting off the dynamic vital force. Bring him again. The next day, Master Lie brought the shaman to see Master Pot Hill. When he came out, he said to Master Lie, It's lucky your teacher met me. He may recover. There is life intact. I saw the shut-off power. Master Lie went in and talked to Master Pot Hill. The master said, That time I showed him sky and earth, unconcerned with fame and property, potential emerging from the heels, this is called shut-off power. Thus, he only saw my capacity for viability. Bring him again. The next day, Master Lie brought the shaman to see Master Pot Hill. When he came out, he said to Master Lie, Your teacher is sitting unsteadily. I have no way to read him. Let him stabilize, then I'll read him. Master Lie went in and told Master Pot Hill. The master said, That time, I showed him complete emptiness, without a trace. He only saw my faculty of leveling energy. Try bringing him again. The next day, Master Lie went to see the shaman to see Master Pot Hill. Before he even came to a standstill, the shaman lost control of himself and ran away. Master Pothill said, Go after him. Master Lie chased him, but he couldn't catch up. He went back and told Master Pothill, He's gone without a trace. I couldn't keep up with him. Master Pothill said, That time I showed him never leaving my source. I harmonized with him by empty energy. He didn't know who or what I was. He took me for reeds bending in the wind, waves going with the flow. Therefore, he fled. He was afraid. After that, Master Lie thought himself as not having begun to learn. So he went home and didn't go out for three years, 
cooking for his wife and feeding the pigs like he was feeding people. He worked without partiality, returning from artifice to simplicity, solidly independent all his life, sealing out conflict and contact in the midst of confusion. He was consistent in this to the end of his days. When Master Lia went to Qi, he turned around midway and came back. Then, he ran into an elder named Stupid Blind Man, who said, Why did you come back? Master Lia said, I got scared. Why did you get scared? I ate at ten taverns, and saw five taverns that let me eat for free. Stupid Blind Man said, So why did you let that scare you? Master Liet said, My inner feelings are not detached, it is revealed physically, creating an emanation that occupies other people's minds, causing them to disregard respect for elders. This brings on trouble. Those tavern keepers are only selling food and drink, gaining only what's left after many expenses. They make but slight profit and have little influence, yet they treat me like this. What about a ruler with 10,000 chariots, who toils for the nation? his mind fully occupied with affairs. He might entrust me with some job and pressure me to do it. That's why I got scared. Elder Stupid Blind Man said, You're very insightful. Once you have a place of your own, people will surround you, and your mind will become troubled. Before long, Master Lia left, and outside, his door was filled with those who came to see him. Elder Stupid Blind Man was just stood facing north. His staff under his chin, after a while, he left without saying a word. Visitors reported this to Master Lia. Master Lia ran barefoot, shoes in hand. When he got to the door, he said, Since you came, teacher, why didn't you leave any remedy? He said, Enough is enough. I told you that people would surround you. And in fact, now they are surrounding you. But you can't get people to not surround you. How do you move them? Trying to induce good feelings produces difference. If you insist on making an impression so much that it destabilizes you, then it is meaningless. None of those hanging around you will tell you this. Their trivial talk is all poison to people. No one alerts, no one enlightens, why associate? When Yang Zhu traveled south to Pei, Lao Dan journeyed west to Qin, trying to intercept him in the countryside. He finally met the old master in Lian. The old master stopped in his tracks, looked up to the sky, and said, At first, I thought that you could be taught, but now you're unteachable. Master Yang did not reply. When they reached a tavern, he presented water, cloth, and comb, took off his shoes outside the door, and went before the old master on his knees, saying, Earlier you looked at the sky and sighed. At first I thought you could be taught. No, you're unteachable. I wanted to ask you to say something, but you kept going on, and I didn't dare. Now you're taking a break. May I ask what my fault is? The old master said, You're arrogant and overbearing. Who could put up with you? Great purity seems ignominious. Mature virtue seems insufficient. Yang Zhu became uneasy, and change came over his face. I have respectfully heard your direction. Before, when Yang Zhu had left, the innkeeper had greeted him and seen him off. The landlords had waited on him. The landladies had held his towel and comb. The lodgers had vacated their seats for him, and those warming themselves made room for him at the fireplace. When he came back, however, lodgers fought him for a seat. Yang Zhu passed through the kingdom of Song. Going east, he came to an inn. The innkeeper had two concubines. One was beautiful, the other was quite ugly. Yet the ugly one was more honored than the beautiful one. Master Yang asked. The innkeeper replied, The beautiful one is beautiful on her own account. I am not cognizant of her beauty. The ugly one is ugly on her own account. I am not cognizant of her ugliness. Yang Zhu said to one of his travelers, Make a note of this. When conduct is noble, while eliminating self-important behavior, where would one not be loved? There is a way of always winning in the world, and the way of not always winning. The way of always winning is called geniality. The way of not always winning is called force. Both are quite easy to know, yet no one knows them. Hence, the ancient saying that force outdoes inferiors, while geniality outdoes superiors. If you outdo inferiors, when you meet equals, you're in danger. If you outdo superiors, there's no danger to you. To master yourself this way is to take responsibility for the world this way. It is called spontaneous victory without conquest, inherent responsibility without appointments. Master Yu said, If you would be forceful, you must protect it by yielding. Develop flexibility, and you will be firm. Cultivate yielding, and you will be strong. 
By observing what is developed, the trends of trouble and fortune can be known. Force overcomes its inferior, meeting an equal. It's destroyed. Geniality overcomes superiors. Its power cannot be measured. Lao Dan said, When an army is forceful, it perishes. When wood is inflexible, it breaks. Geniality and yielding are cohorts of life. Inflexibility and force are the cohorts of death. There may be similarity in understanding without a similarity in outward form. There may also be similarity in form without similarity in understanding. The wise one who embraces similarity of understanding and pays no regard to similarity of form. The world in general is attracted to similarity of form, but it remains at an indifference to similarity of understanding. Those creatures that resemble them in shape they love and consort with. Those that differ from them in shape, they fear and keep at a distance. This creature has a skeleton that's six feet tall, hands differently shaped from their feet, hair on its head, and an even set of teeth in its jaws, walks upright, and is called a man. But it does not follow that a man may not have the mind of a brute. Even though this be the case, other men will still recognize him as one of their own species, in his virtue of his outward form. The creatures which have wings on their back, or horns on their head, serrated teeth, or extensile talons, which fly overhead or run on all fours, are called birds and beasts. But it does not follow that a bird or a beast may not have the mind of a man. Yet, even if this be so, it is nevertheless assigned to another species because of its difference in form. Pao Shi, Nu Kua, Sheng Nung, and Xia Huo had serpents' bodies, human faces, ox heads, and tiger snouts. Thus, their forms were decidedly not human. Yet their virtue was of the saintliest. Chia of the Xia dynasty, Zhou of the Yin, Yuan of the Lu, Mu of the Chu, were all in external aspects, as facial appearance, and in possession of the seven channels of sense. Unlike other men, yet, they had the minds of savage brutes. How is it, then, that in seeking perfect understanding, men attend to the outward form alone, which it will not bring wisdom to them? When the Yellow Emperor fought with Yen Ti on the field of Po Chuan, his vanguard was composed of bears, wolves, panthers, lynxes, and tigers, while his ensign bearers were eagles, ospreys, falcons, and kites. This was a forcible impressment of animals into the service of man. Emperor Yao entrusted Kuei with the regulation of music. Kuei was a composite being, half beast, half man, and he had irreproachable virtue. His son, on the other hand, is said to have had the heart of a pig. He was insatiably gluttonous, covetous, and quarrelsome. When the latter tapped a musical stone in varying cadence, all the animals danced to the sound of music. When the Shao in its nine variations was heard on the flute, the phoenix itself flew down to assist. There was an attraction of animals by the power of music. In what, then, do minds of birds and beasts differ from the minds of men? Their shapes and sounds they utter are different from ours, and they have no way of communicating with us. But the wisdom and penetrating insight of a sage is unlimited. Why is it that he is able to lead them? to do his bidding. The intelligence of animals is innate, even as that of a man. Their common desire is for self-preservation, but they do not borrow their knowledge from men. There is pairing between male and female, and mutual attachment between mother and her young. They shun the open plain and keep to the mountainous parts. They flee the cold and make for the warmth. When they settle, they gather in flocks. When they travel, they preserve a fixed order. The young ones are stationed in the middle. The stronger ones place themselves on the outside. They show one another the ways of the drinking places. They call to their fellows when there's food. In the earliest stages, they dwelt and moved about in the company of men. It was not until the age of emperors and kings that they began to be afraid and broke into their scattered bands. And now, in the final period, they habitually hide and keep away from man to avoid injury at his hands. At the present day, in the country of the Qi clan to the east, people can often interpret the language of six domestic animals but they probably only have but an imperfect understanding of it. In the ancient days, there were men of divine enlightenment who were perfectly acquainted with the feelings and habits of all living beings, and thoroughly understood the language of the many species. They brought them together, trained them, and admitted them to their society, exactly as though they were human beings. The sages declared that, in mind and understanding, there is no wide gulf between any of the living species endowed with blood and breath, and therefore, Knowing this is so, they omitted nothing from their course of training and instruction. In the state of Song, there's a monkey trainer who liked monkeys, and raised a troop of them. 
He was able to understand the monkey's thoughts, and the monkeys understood his thoughts. He reduced his own family's food to satisfy the monkeys, but ran short and had to limit their food too. Fearing the monkeys might not agree with him anymore, at first he lied to them, saying, I'll give you chestnuts three in the morning and four in the evening. Will that be enough? The monkeys rose up in a fury. Then he said, How about if I give you four chestnuts in the morning and three in the evening? The monkeys quieted down, pleased. When people entrap each other through the differences of their abilities, it's always like this. Sages use intelligence to encompass ignorant people, the way a monkey trainer used his wits to trap the monkeys. The terms and realities may be equivalent, yet they cause them to be glad or mad. Master Ji Shen raised a fighting chicken for King Zhuan of the Zhou Dynasty. After a period of ten days, the king asked, Can the cock fight yet? He said, Not yet, it's just strutting about proudly. Ten days later, the king asked the same question. He said, Not yet, it still responds to shadows and echoes. Ten days later, the king asked again. Ji Sheng said, Not yet, it's still glaring and meddlesome. Ten days later, the king asked the same question. Ji Sheng said, Almost. It no longer shows any change when another cock cries. It faces others like a wooden rooster. Its powers are complete. No cocks could face up to it. They would just run the other way. Hui Yang went to the Prince Kong of the Shun State. The prince, however, stamped his foot, rasped his throat, and said angrily, The things that I care about are courage and strength. I have no fondness for your proclaimed good and virtuous people. What can a stranger like you even teach me? I have a secret, Hui Yang said, whereby my enemy, however brave or strong, can be prevented from harming me, either by thrust or by blow. Would then not your highness care to know my secret? Ah yes, claimed Kong. This is certainly something I'd love to hear about. Hui Yang went on. To render ineffectual the stabs and blows of one's opponent is indeed to cower him in shame. But my secret is one which will make all your opponents, either brave or strong, afraid to stab or strike at all. His being afraid, however, does not always imply that he has not the will to do so. Now, my secret method operates so that the will is absent, not having the will to harm however, does not necessarily connote the desire to do love or to do good. But my secret is one whereby every man, woman, and child in the world shall be inspired with the friendly desire to love and to do good to another. Now this is something that transcends all social distinctions and is much better than mere possession of your courage and strength. Has your highness no mind to acquire a secret so powerful as this? Nay, said the prince, I am anxious to learn it. What is the secret, pray tell? Oh, nothing else, replied Hui Yang, than the teachings of Confucius and Mo Tzu. Now these men, Confucius and Mo Tzu, neither of them possessed any land, and yet they were princes. They held no official rank, and yet they were leaders. All the inhabitants of the empire, old or young, used to crane their necks and stand tiptoe to catch but a mere glimpse of them, for it was their object to bring peace and happiness to the whole world. Now, your highness is lord of an empire with 10,000 chariots, quite powerful indeed. If you are sincere in your purpose, all the people in the four borders of your realm will reap benefit, and the fame of your virtue will far exceed that of Confucius or Motsu. The Prince of Song found himself at a loss for an answer. Hui Yang quickly withdrew, and the prince turned to his courtiers and said, Forcible argument. The stranger has carried me away with his eloquence. I must alight. Book 3 Dreams, King Mu of Zhou. In the time of King Mu of Zhou, there was a magician who came from a kingdom in the far west. He could pass through fire and water, penetrate metal and stone, overturn mountains and make rivers flow backwards, transplant whole towns and cities, ride on thin air without falling, encounter solid bodies of mass without being obstructed. There was no end to the countless variety of changes and transformations he could effect. And besides changing the external form, he could also spirit away men's internal cares. King Mu revered him as a god, and served him like a prince. He set aside for his spacious use of apartments, regaled him with the daintiest of food, and selected a number of singing girls for his express gratification. The magician, however, condemned the king's palace as mean, the cooking as rancid, and the concubines as simply being too ugly to be near. So King Mu had a new building erected to please him, it was built entirely of bricks and wood, and gorgeously decorated in red and white, no skill being spared in its construction. 
The five royal treasuries were empty by the time the new pavilion was complete. It stood 6,000 feet high, overtopping Mount Chungnan, and it was called Touching the Sky Pavilion. Then, the king proceeded to fill it with maidens, selected from Chung and Wai, of the most exquisite and delicate beauty. They were anointed with fragrant perfumes, adorned with moth eyebrows, and provided with jeweled hair pins and earrings, and arrayed in the finest silks, with the costliest satin trains, their faces were powdered, and their eyebrows penciled, their girdles were studded with precious stones, all manner of sweet-scented plants filled the palace with their odors, and ravishing music of the ancient times was played to the honored guest. Every month he was presented with new, fresh, and costly silken clothes, and every morning he had set before him some new and delicious food from far off. The magician could not well refuse to take up his abode in the Palace of Delight, but he had not dwelt very long before he invited the king to accompany him on a jaunt. So the king clutched the magician's sleeve, and they soared up higher and higher into the sky, until at last they stopped, and lo, they had reached the magician's own palace. The palace was built with beams of gold and silver, and encrusted with pearls and jade. It towered high above the region of clouds and rain, and the foundations whereon it rested were unknown. It appeared like a stupendous cloud mass to the view. The sights and sound offered to eye and ear, the scents and flavors there abounded. These sensations were such that they did not exist to mortal ken. The king verily believed that he was in the halls of paradise, tenanted by heaven himself, and he was listening to the mighty music of the spheres. He gazed on his own palace on the earth below, and it seemed to him no better than a rude pile of clods and brushwood. It seemed to the king as if his stay in this place lasted for several decades, during which he gave no thought at all to his own kingdom. Then, the magician invited him to make another journey, and into a new region they came, where neither sun nor moon could be seen in the heavens above, nor any rivers or seas below. The king's eyes were dazed by the quantity and quality of the light, and he lost the power of vision, his ears were stunned by the sounds that assailed him, and he lost his faculty of hearing. The framework of his bones and his internal organs were thrown out of gear, and refused to function. His thoughts were in a whirl, his intellect was clouded, and he begged the magician to take him back. Thereupon, the magician gave him a shove, and the king experienced a sensation of falling through space, onward and onward towards the earth. When he awoke to consciousness, he found himself sitting on his throne just as he was before, with all the attendants around him. He looked at the wine in front of him, and saw that it, the glass was still full. He looked at the foods around him, and found that they had not lost their freshness at all. He asked where he had come from, and his attendants told him that he was only sitting there quietly. This threw King Mu into a reverie of reflection, and it was three months before he was truly himself again. Then, he made further inquiry, and asked the magician to explain what actually happened. Your majesty and I, replied the magician, were only wandering about in spirit, and of course our bodies never moved at all. How could they? What essential difference is there between that sky palace we dwelt in, and your majesty's palace on earth? between the spaces we traveled to your majesty's own park. Looking from the standpoint of the absolute, both palaces are unreal. You are accustomed to being permanently in the body, and cannot understand being out of it for a while. Can any number of changes or successive intervals of fast and slow fully represent the true scheme of things? The king was much pleased. He ceased to worry about affairs of state, and took no further pleasure in the society of his ministers and concubines. The Sky Palace was only some degrees finer than the King's, just as the King's Palace was really only some degrees finer than the hovel of a peasant. To strive for something that shall satisfy men's desires and aspirations once and for all is only labor lost. The story continues with an account of the King's marvelous journey to the West, but though he drained the cup of pleasure to the dregs, the upshot of it all was that he never truly attained the Tao. We may seek the moral in a saying of Lao Tzu, Without going out of doors, one may know the whole world. Without looking through a window, one may see the way of heaven. The farther one travels, the less one knows. Lao Chung Su went to learn magic from the venerable Yin Wen. After a period of three years, having attained no communication, he humbly asked for permission to go home. Yin Wen bowed and led him to the inner apartment. There, having dismissed all of his attendants, he spoke to him as follows. Long ago, when Lao Tzu was setting out on his journey to the west, he addressed me and said, All that has the breath of life, all that possesses bodily form, is merely an illusion. The point at which creation begins, the change affected by the dual principles, these are called respectively, 
life and death. That which underlines the manifold workings of destiny is called evolution, and that which produces and transforms bodily substance is called illusion. The ingenuity of a creative power is mysterious, and its operations are profound. In truth, it is inexhaustible and external. How should the creative power of Tao possess a conscious mind? It is spontaneity that constitutes the mystery. Spirit and matter eagerly come together and coalesce into perceptible forms. Following the path of evolution, they proceed on their way, and before long relapse into nothingness. The ingenuity of that which ceases material form is patent to the eye, and its operations are superficial. Therefore it arises anonymously, and anonymously it vanishes. Only one that knows life is really an illusion, and that death is really an evolution, can begin to learn magic from me. You and I are both illusions. What need, then, to make study of the subject? If a person wishes to make study of an illusion, in spite of the fact that his own body is an illusion, we are reduced to the absurdity of an illusion trying to study an illusion. Lao Cheng Su returned home, and for three months pondered deeply on the words of the venerable Yin Wen. Subsequently, he had the power of appearing or disappearing at will. He could reverse the order of the four seasons, produce thunderstorms in winter and ice storms in summer, make flying things creep and creeping things fly. But to the end of his days, he never published the secrets of his arts so that it is not handed down to later generations. Master Lietzu said, A dream is something that comes in contact to the mind. An external event is something that impinges on the body. Hence our feelings day by day, and our dreams night by night, are a result of contacts made by our mind or body. It follows that if we can concentrate the made in abstraction, our feelings and our dreams will vanish of themselves. Those who rely on working perceptions will not argue about them. Those who put faith in dreams do not understand the process in the external world. The pure men of old passed down their waking existence in self-oblivion and slept without dreams. How can this be dismissed as an empty phrase? Consciousness has eight manifestations. Dreaming has six symptoms. What are the eight manifestations of consciousness? Purpose, action, gain, loss, sadness, happiness, birth, and death. These are experienced by the physical body. What are the six symptoms of dreaming? There is normal dreaming, dreaming due to fright, dreaming due to thinking, waking dreaming, joyful dreaming, and fearful dreaming. These come from psychic interaction. When things occur through unconscious sense and change, one is confused about their source when they happen. When things occur through conscious sense and change, one knows their source when they happen. When one knows their source, one has no fear. The cyclical fluctuations of the body are all related to heaven and earth and correspond to types of thinking. So when yin energy is strong, one dreams of crossing large bodies of water and being afraid. When yang energy is strong, one dreams of going through fire and burning. When yin and yang are both strong, one dreams of life and death. When very full, one dreams of giving. When very hungry, one dreams of getting. Those whose affliction is flighty insubstantially dream of floating, while those whose affliction is depressive gravity dream of sinking. When you sleep with a belt on, you dream of snakes. If a bird in flight pecks at your hair, you dream of flying. On the verge of a chill, you dream of fire. On the verge of sickness, you dream of food. One who drinks wine will be sad. One who sings and dances will lament in their sleep. Master Liet said, Psychic encounters make dreams. Physical encounters create phenomenon. Therefore, thoughts during the day and dreams during the night are encounters of the mind and body. Therefore, thoughts and dreams naturally disappear in one whose mind is stable. True awareness is not spoken. True dreams are not interpreted. They are the process of assimilation of things. The real people of antiquity spontaneously forgot their awareness and did not dream when they slept. Does this not make sense? In the southern corner of the extreme west, there is a country of unknown borders called Pristine Wasteland, where yin and yang energies do not mix, so hot and cold are not differentiated, where sun and moon do not shine, and so day and night are not differentiated. People thus do not eat or wear clothes, but mostly sleep. Waking once every 50 days, they think what they do in dreams is real, and the things that they see while awake is illusory. In the middle of the Four Seas is called Central Country, it straddles the Yellow River south to north. 
It crosses Mount Tai east to west, extending thousands of miles, where yin and yang are respectively and precisely regular. So cold and heat alternate, dark and light are clearly divided, so day and night alternate. Some of the people there are intelligent, a fair number are foolish. All creatures reproduce abundantly, and all people have very many talents and skills. There are rulers and ministers over them, with rights and laws governing them. Their utterances and actions are countless. Alternatively waking and sleeping, they consider their doings while awake to be real, and their perceptions while dreaming to be merely an illusion. In the crumbling northern corner in the far east, there is a land called Country of Crumbling Mounds. There is weather that is always hot. The soil doesn't produce good crops on account of the excess sun and moonlight. The people there eat roots and nuts, and don't know at all how to cook. They are hard-hearted and very violent, and the strong oppress the weak. They value conquest without caring of justice. They mostly run and seldom rest. They're always awake, and are never found sleeping. Such is the manner of Yin and Yan. Lord Yin of Zhou was an owner of a large estate who harried his servants unmercifully and gave them no rest from morning to night. There was an old servant in particular whose physical strength had quite left him, yet his master worked him all the harder. All day long he was groaning as he went about his work, and when night came, he was reeling with fatigue and would sleep like a dog. His spirit was then free to wander at will, and every night he dreamt that he was a king, enthroned in authority over the multitude, controlling the affairs of the whole state. He took his pleasure in palaces and hunting lodges, following his own fancy in everything, and his happiness was beyond comparison. But when he awoke, he was a servant once more. To someone who condoled him on his hard lot in life, the old man said, Human life may last a hundred years, and the whole of it is equally divided into days and nights. During the daytime, it is true that I am a slave, and my misery cannot be denied as well. But by night I am a king, and my happiness is beyond compare. So, what do I have to grumble at? Now, the landlord, Mr. Yin's mind, was full of worldly cares, and he was always thinking of anxious solicitude about the affairs of his estate. Thus, he was wearing out mind and body alike, and at night, he would also fall asleep, utterly exhausted. Every night, he dreamt that he was another man's slave, running about on menial business of every description, and that he was subjected to every kind of possible abuse and ill-treatment. He would speak and groan in his sleep, and obtained no relief until morning came. These states of things, at last, resulted in a serious illness, and Lord Yin besought the advice of a friend. His friend said, Your station in life is a distinguished one, and you have much wealth and property in abundance. In these respects, you are far above the average man. If at night you dream that you are a servant and exchange ease for affliction, that is only the proper balance in human destiny. What you want is that your dreams should be as pleasant as your waking moments, but that is beyond your power to compass. On hearing what his friend said, Mr. Yin lightened his servant's toil and allowed his own mental worry to abate, whereupon his illness began to decrease in proportion. A man was gathering fuel in the Chung state when he fell in with a deer that had been startled from its usual haunts. He gave chase, and succeeded in killing it. He was overjoyed at his good luck, but, for fear of discovery, he hastily concealed the carcass in a dry ditch, and covered it up with brushwood. Afterwards, he forgot the spot where he had hidden the deer, and finally, he became convinced that the whole affair was only a dream. He told the story to people he met as he went along, and one of those heard it, following the indications given, went and found the deer. On returning home with his loot, this man made the following statement to his wife. Once upon a time, he said, a woodcutter dreamt that he'd got a deer, but couldn't remember the place where he put it. Now I found the deer, so it appears that this dream was a true dream. On the contrary, his wife said, it is you who must have dreamt that you met a woodcutter who had caught a deer. Here you have a deer, true enough, but where's the woodcutter? It is evidently your dream that has come true. I have certainly got a deer, replied her husband, so what does it matter to us whether this was his dream or mine? Meanwhile, the woodcutter had gone home, not at all disgusted at having lost a deer, for he thought the whole thing must itself have been a dream. But the same night, he saw in the dream the place where he had actually hidden the deer, and he also dreamt of the man who had taken it. So, the next morning, in accordance with his dream, he went to seek him out in order to recover his deer. A quarrel ensued and the matter was finally brought before the judge, who gave a judgment in these terms. You, he said to the woodcutter, 
began by really killing a deer, but wrongly thought it was a dream. Then you really dreamt that you had got a deer, but wrongly took the dream to be reality. The other man took your deer, which he is now disputing with you. His wife, on the other hand, declares that she saw both man and deer in a dream, so that nobody can be said to have killed the deer at all. Meanwhile, here is the deer itself in court, and that you had better divide it between the two. The case was reported to the prince of the Chung state, who said, Why, the judge must have dreamt the whole thing himself. The question was referred to the prime minister, but the latter confessed himself unable to disentangle the part that was the dream from the part which was not a dream. If you want to distinguish between waking and dreaming, he said, only the yellow emperor or Confucius could help you, but both of these sages are now long dead. There is nobody alive who can draw any such distinction. Of course, it is implied that there is no real distinction between the two, so the best thing you can do then is uphold the judge's decision. Mr. Yang Li Huatsu of the Sung State was afflicted in middle age by constant loss of memory. Anything he learned in the morning he had forgotten by the evening. Anything he gave away in the evening he had forgotten the next morning. Out of doors he forgot to walk, indoors he forgets to sit down. At any given moment he has no recollection what had just taken place, and a little later on he could not even recollect what had happened then. All his family were perfectly disgusted with him. Fortune tellers were summoned but their divinations proved quite unsuccessful. Shamans were sought out, but their exorcisms were ineffectual. Doctors were called in, but their remedies were of no avail. At last, a learned professional of the Lu state volunteered his services, declaring that he could effect a cure. Huatsu's wife and family immediately offered him half of their estate if only he could tell them how to set to work. The professor replied, This is a case which cannot be dealt by the means of auspices and diagrams, the evil, then, cannot be removed by prayers and incantations, nor successfully combated by drugs and potions. What I shall try to do is influence his mind, and turn the current of his thoughts. In that way, a cure is likely to be found. Accordingly, the experiment had begun. The professor exposed his patient to cold, so that he was forced to beg for clothes, subjected him to hunger, so that he was fain to ask for food, left him in darkness, so that he was obligated to search for light. Soon, he was able to report progress to the sons of the house, saying gleefully, The disease can be checked, but the methods I shall employ have been handed down as a secret in my family, and cannot be made known to the public. All attendants then, therefore, should be kept out of the way. I must be shut up in my place with the patient. The professor was allowed to have his way, and from the space of seven days no one knew what was going on in the sick man's chamber. Then, one fine morning, the treatment had come to an end. And, wonderful to relate, the disease of so many years standing had disappeared. No sooner had Mr. Huatsu regained his senses, however, he flew into a great rage, drove his wife out of doors, beat his sons, and snatching up a spear, hotly pursued the professor out of his home and out of town. On being arrested and asked to explain his conduct, this is what he said. Lately, I was steeped in forgetfulness. My senses were so benumbed that I was quite unconscious to the existence of the outer world, but now I have been brought suddenly to the perception of the events of half a lifetime. Preservation and destruction, gain and loss, sorrow and joy, love and hate have begun to throw out their myriad tentacles to invade my peace, and these emotions will, I fear, continue to keep my mind in a state of turmoil that I now experience. Oh, if I could but recapture a short moment of that blessed oblivion! If such is the man's reaction to the infirmity which resembles the highest principle, how much greater will be the effect of the incorporation of the Tao? Mr. Pong of Qin had a son who was intelligent in youth, but suffered from confusion and disorientation as he grew up. He heard joyful songs as funeral dirges, saw white as black, who smelt sweet fragrance as putrid, tasted delicious food as bitter and wrong, had wrong thinking right, and in his mind, everything was reversed. Sky and earth, four directions, wind and fire, cold and heat. Mr. Yang said to the father, The gentlemen of Lu have many skills. Perhaps they can cure him. Why don't you go and find them? The father went to Lu, but as he was passing through Chun to meet Lao Dan, he told him of his son's symptoms. Lao Dan said, How do you know your son is confused? Nowadays, everyone in the world is so confused about right and wrong, blind about what is beneficial and what is truly harmful. There are so many with the same affliction that no one realizes it. 
However, confusion in one person is not enough to ruin a whole family. Confusion in one family is not enough to destroy a whole community. Confusion in one community is not enough to destroy a whole country. Confusion in one country is not enough to destroy the whole world. But if the whole world is confused, who destroyed it? If everyone in the world had a mind like your son, then you would be the one who's confused. Who can correct sorrow and happiness, sound and form, scent and flavor, right and wrong? Furthermore, these words of mine are not necessarily not confused. How much more is the reserve of the gentlemen of Lu, who are the most confused of all? How can they resolve others' confusion? You'd best pack up your bag and go straight home, mister. There was once a man who, though born in Yen, was brought up in Chu, and it was only in his old age that he was able to return to his native country of Chu. Yen was the northernmost state in ancient China, while Chu was bounded by the left bank of the Yangtze to the south. On the way there, as he was passing through the Qin state, a fellow traveler played a practical joke on him, pointed to a city, and said, Here is the capital of the Yen state. Thereupon the old man flushed with excitement. Pointing out a certain shrine, he told him that it was his own village altar. The old man heaved a deep sigh. Then he showed him a house, and said, this is where your ancestors lived, and tears welled up in the old man's eyes. Finally, a mound was pointed to him as a tomb of his ancestors long buried. Thereupon, the old man could not control himself any longer, and began to weep aloud. But his fellow traveler burst into roars of laughter. I've been tricking you, he said. This is only the Qin state. His victim was greatly mortified, and he, when he arrived at his actual journey's end, and really did see before him the city and altars of Yen, with the actual abode and tombs of his ancestors, the old man's emotions were not as strong, having expended all of his grief on a mere illusion. Book 4. The Thoughts of Confucius When Confucius was living in retirement, Zhigong went to wait on him, and found him looking sad. Zhigong didn't dare to question him. He went out and told Yan Hui, Yan Hui picked up a harp and sang. Confucius heard it and called to him, asking, Yan Hui, why are you so happy? Yan Hui said, Why are you so sad? Confucius said, First tell me what you mean. Yan Hui said, In the past, I heard you say that if one is content with creation and acknowledges destiny, one will thus not be sad. That is why I am happy. Confucius remained silent for a while, looking offended. Then he said, Did I say that? Your conception is mistaken. This is something I said in the past, that's all. Please consider what I say now to be correct. You only know the carefree condition of accepting creation and acknowledging destiny. You don't know the magnitude of grief of accepting creation and acknowledging destiny. Now I will inform you the actual reality of it. Cultivating your individual self, not caring whether you're struggling or successful, knowing that all things come and go are not yourself. Unconcerned by change and chaos, this is what you call the freedom from sorrow that comes from accepting creation and acknowledging destiny. In the past, I edited the classics of poetry and history, and reformed rituals and music, to govern the land and bequeath to coming generations. I didn't just cultivate myself as an individual. I brought up order in the state of Lu, but the rulers and ministers of Lu are losing their proper relationships day by day. Humanity and justice are declining, while feeling and character are weakening. If the way is not practiced in one state, as it was in the past years, what will then become of the world in the future? That's how I've come to realize that poetry and history, rituals and music, are no help in bringing order to chaos. Yet, I don't know how to change them. This is what those who accept creation and acknowledge destiny lament. Even so, I have realized this. Acceptance and acknowledgement are not what the ancients called acceptance and acknowledgement. Accepting nothing and acknowledging nothing are true acceptance and true acknowledgement. Thus, there is nothing one cannot actually accept, and nothing that one cannot actually acknowledge. Nothing one is not actually concerned about, and nothing one will not do. Why abandon poetry and history, ritual and music? Why change them at all? Yan Hui paid respect to Confucius and said, I get it too. Then he went out and told Ji Gong. Ji Gong was stunned. He went home and thought intensely for seven days, neither sleeping or eating, to the point that his bones stood out. Yan Hui went again to explain it to him, and when he returned to the school of Confucius, where he played music, 
sang poetry, and read books for the remainder of his days. When the Grandee Chen made an ambassadorial visit to the state of Lu, he met privately with Mr. Su Shun. Mr. Su Shun said, There is a sage in our state. Chen said, Isn't it Confucius? Su Shun said, oh, Yes. Chen asked, How do you know that he's a sage? Mr. Su Shun said, I've often heard Yan Hui say that Confucius can use his body without his mind. Chun said, There's a sage in my state too, don't you know? Su Shun asked, What sage then are you referring to? Chen said, There is a disciple of Lao Dan, called the Master of the Hidden Storehouse. Having attained Dan's Tao, he can see with his ears and hear with his eyes. When the Lord of Lu heard all of this, he was amazed. He had a top noble invite that master with all courtesy. The master of the hidden storehouse came in response to the invitation. The Lord of Lu humbly asked about his abilities. The master of the hidden storehouse said, This has been reported mistakenly. I am able to see and hear without using my eyes and ears. I can't interchange the function of eye and ear. The Lord of Lu said, This is even more extraordinary. How is it done? Pray tell me. The master of hidden storehouse said, my body merges with mind, mind merges with energy, energy merges with spirit, spirit merges with nothingness. Whatever comes to me, the slightest existent, the faintest sound, be it far beyond the eight infinites, or as close between an eyebrow and an eyelash, I invariably cognize it. But I don't know if this is the awareness of my seven apertures or four limbs, or the cognition of my heart, gut, and internal organs. It's just spontaneous knowing, that's all. The Lord of Lu was delighted. Another day he told Confucius. Confucius simply smiled, but did not reply. A high official from Shang paid a visit to Confucius. You are a sage, are you not? he inquired. A sage, replied Confucius. How could I venture to think so? I'm only a man with a wide range of learning and information. The minister then asked, Were the three kings sages? The three kings, replied Confucius, were great in the exercise of wisdom and courage. I do not know, however, whether they were sages. What of the five emperors? Were they not sages? The five emperors excelled in the exercise of altruism and righteousness. I do not know if they were sages. And the three sovereigns, surely they were sages. The three sovereigns excelled in the virtues that were suited to their age. But whether or not they were sages, I cannot really say. The wide learning of Confucius, the warlike prowess of Tang and Wu, the humility and self-abnegation of Yao and Shun, and the rude simplicity of Fu Shi and Sheng Nung, simply represent the ordinary activities of a sage who accommodates himself of the necessities of the world in which he lives. They are not the qualities which make them sages. Those qualities are truly such as neither word nor deed can adequately express. Why, who is there then? cried the minister, much astonished. That is really a sage! The expression of Confucius's countenance changed, but he replied after a pause. Among the people of the West, a true sage dwells. He governs not, yet there is no disorder. He speaks not, yet he is naturally trusted. He makes no government reforms, yet right conduct of the people is spontaneous and universal. He is so great and incomprehensible that the people cannot find a name to call him by. I suspect that this man is a sage, but whether or not in truth he is a sage, or is not a sage, I do not and cannot know. The minister from Shang meditated a while in silence. Then he said to himself, That Confucius is making a fool of me. Zi Zha asked Confucius, What is Yan Hui's character like? Confucius said, Hui's humaneness is greater than mine. What about Zhi Gong's character? Confucius said, his eloquence is greater than mine. What about Ji Lu's character? Confucius said, His bravery is greater than mine. What about Zi Shang's character? Confucius said, His dignity is greater than mine. Zi Jia got off his seat and asked, Why then do these four attend you, master? Confucius said, Sit down and I'll tell you. Yan Hui is capable of being humane, but not capable of change. Ji Gong is capable of being eloquent, but not capable of being silent. Zhi Lu is capable of bravery, but not capable of reticence. Zhi Zhang is capable of being dignified, but not capable of conforming. If one who had what all four had were to slight me, I wouldn't accept it. This is why they attend me devotedly.
When the master Liet Zhu took up an abode in Nan Kuo, the number of those who settled down with him was past reckoning. Though one were to count them day by day, Liet Zhu said, however, continuing to live in retirement, and every morning he would hold discussions with them, the fame of which spread far and wide. Nan Kuo Zhu was his next door neighbor, but for twenty years they paid no visit between them, and when they met in the street they made as though they had never seen each other. There was a mysterious harmony between their doctrines, and therefore they arrived at old age without having had any mutual intercourse. Liet Zhu's disciples felt convinced that there was some kind of enmity between the master and Nan Kuo Tzu, and at last, one who had come from the Chu state spoke to Liet Zhu about it, saying, How comes it, sir, that you and Nan Kuo Tzu are enemies? Nan Kuo Tzu, said the master, has the appearance of fullness, but his mind is unlike. His ears do not hear, his eyes do not see, his mouth does not speak, his mind is devoid of knowledge, his body is free from agitation. What would be the object of visiting him? However, we will try, and you shall accompany there to see. Accordingly, forty of the disciples went with him to call on Master Nan Kuo Tzu, who turned out to be a repulsive-looking creature, with whom they could make no real contact. He only gazed blankly at Liet Tzu. Mind and body seemed not to belong together, and his guests could not find any means to approach him. The soul had subjugated the body. The mind being void of sense impressions, the countenance remained motionless. Hence, it seemed as though there was no cooperation between the two. How could they respond to external stimuli? Suddenly, Nan Kuo Tzu singled out the hindmost row from Liet Tzu's disciples and began to talk to them quite pleasantly and simply, though in a tone of a superior. Fraternizing with the hindmost row, he recognized no distinctions of rank or standing, meaning a sympathetic influence, and responding thereto, he did not allow his mind to be occupied with the external. The disciples were astonished by this, and when they got to go home, all were a puzzled expression. Then, Master Liet Tzu said to him, He who has reached the stage of thought is silent. He who has attained the perfect knowledge is also silent. He who uses silence in lieu of speech really does speak. He who for knowledge substitutes blankness of mind really does know. Without words and speaking not, without knowledge and knowing not, he really speaks and he really knows. Saying nothing and knowing nothing, there is in reality nothing he does not say, nothing he does not know. This is how the matter stands. There is nothing further to be said. Why are you astonished without cause? When Master Lie was an apprentice, after three years he no longer presumed to think of right and wrong, did not dare speak of gain and loss. Only then did old Shang take him in. After five years, he again began to think of right and wrong, and spoke of gain and loss. Only then did old Shang smile. After seven years, there was no right or wrong in whatever he thought, no gain or loss in whatever he said. Then, the master let him sit next to him for the first time. After nine years, he gave free rein to thought and speech without being conscious of his own right or wrong or gain and loss, or others' right or wrong, or others' gain and loss. Inside and outside were ended. After this, his eyes were like ears, his ears were like a nose, his nose was like a mouth, all the same, his mind was still, his body relaxed, his bones and muscles merged, he was not aware of what his body rested on, what his feet walked on, and what his mind thought of, what his words contained. This is how he was, that's all. So logically, he had nothing to hide. At first, the master Lie liked traveling, but the master of Pod Hill asked him, You like traveling? What do you like about traveling? Lie said, the pleasure of traveling is the scenery never gets familiar. Other people travel to see sights. I travel to see changes. There is no one who can distinguish travel of one kind from another. The master of Pothill said, Your traveling is certainly the same as others, yet you insist it's different. Whatever the sights, their changes are always seen. You enjoy the inconsistency of things without being aware of your own inconsistency. You travel outward without knowing how to gaze inward. Those who travel outward seek completeness in things. Those who gain inward gain sufficiency in themselves. Finding sufficiency in oneself is the goal of travel. Seeking completeness in things is travel without success. Master Lia never went out again for the rest of his life, thinking he didn't know how to travel. Then, Master Pothill said to him, Isn't this the goal of travel? Supreme travel doesn't know where it goes, and supreme gazing does not know what it observes. 
Everything is travel. Everything is observation. This is travel. This is what I call gazing. That's why I suggest that this is the goal of travel. Long Shu said to the renowned doctor known as Wen Shi, You are a master of subtle medical arts. I have an illness. Can you cure it, sir? I am at your service, said Wen Shi. But please let me know of your symptoms of the disease. I hold it no honor, said Long Shu, to be praised in my native village. Nor do I consider it a disgrace to be derided by my own native state. Gain excites me no joy. Loss gives me no sorrow. I look upon life in the same light as death. I look upon riches in the same light as poverty. I look upon my fellow men as so many swine. I look upon myself as I look upon my fellow men, as swine. I dwell in my own home as it was a mere roadside hovel, and regard my native district with no more feelings than I would a barbarian tribe. Afflicted as I am in these various ways, honors and rewards fail to rouse me, pains and penalties to overawe me, good or bad fortune to influence me, joy or grief to move me. Thus I am incapable of serving my monarch, of associating with my friends and kinsmen, of directing my wife and children, or of controlling my servants and retainers. Men are controlled by external influences, insofar as their minds are open to impressions of good and evil, and their bodies are sensitive to injury or the reverse. But one who is able to discern a connecting unity in the most multiform diversity will surely, in his surveys of the universe, be unconscious of the difference between positive and negative. What disease is this, and what remedy or cure is there? Wan Chi replied by asking Master Lung Shu to stand with his back to the light, while he himself faced the light and looked at him intently. Ah, he said after a while, I see that there's a good square inch of your heart that is hollow. You are within an inch of becoming a true sage. Six of the orifices of your heart are open and clear. Only the seventh remains closed. This, however, is doubtless due to the fact that you are mistaking for a disease what is actually enlightenment. Well, in this case, my shallow art is of no avail, sir. What is always alive, without coming from anywhere, is the Tao. What is alive due to life, and therefore doesn't perish in spite of ending, is eternity. To perish because of living is unfortunate. To die normally for a reason is also the Tao. To die because of death, therefore perishing spontaneously, though not finished, is also normal. To come to life on account of death is fortune. Therefore, living without servile compulsion is called the Tao, while attaining an end by the means of the Tao is called eternity. To die for a practical purpose is also referred to as the Tao. To die by the Tao is also called eternity. When Ji Liang died, Yang Zhu sang in front of his house. When Sui Wu died, Yang Zhu patted the corpse and cried. When people are born and common people die, the commoners sing and the commoners cry. One who's about to go blind can see a strand of hair before. One who's about to go deaf can hear a gnat flying before. One who's about to lose the sense of taste can distinguish water from different rivers before. One who's about to lose the sense of smell can detect scorching and decay before. One who's getting stiff is agile and limber before. One who is getting confused discerns right from wrong before. Thus, it is that things do not revert until they reach their peak. There are many wise people in the wilds of Zhong, many intellectuals in the East Village. Among the followers in the wilds was a certain uncle rich man passing through East Village on a journey. There, he met the legalist and logician, Mr. Deng Ji. Deng Ji turned around and looked at his disciples. Smiling, he said, I'll tease this visitor for you. How would you like that? His disciples said, That's something we'd like to witness. Deng Ji said to Uncle Rich Man, Do you know the meaning of the theory of sustenance? Those who feed off of others and can't feed themselves are comparable to the dogs and pigs. To raise animals or feed people so that the animals or people work for you is human power. To enable your followers to eat their fill, dress well, and to have leisure to rest is an accomplishment of government. If old and young gather in crowds only to be penned in cages to be slaughtered for the kitchens, how are they any different from the dogs and pigs? Uncle Rich Man didn't answer. A follower of Uncle Rich Man came forward out and said, 
Haven't you heard of the many skills of the states of Ji and Lu, sir? There are those skilled in construction and carpentry, those skilled in metallurgy and leatherworking, those skilled in song and music, those skilled in literature and mathematics, those skilled in military actions, those skilled in religious ceremony. A plurality of those abilities is available, yet there is no leadership, no one who can put them to work. Instead, the leaders are ignorant, the employers are incompetent, and yet those who know this and are capable still work for them. Rulers are my errand boys. It is we, the people in the middle, who can be said to employ the government. What are you so proud of? Deng Ji had no reply. With a look to his followers, he retreated to the back rooms. Gong Yi Bai was famed among the lords for strength. The duke spoke of this to the king Zhuan of Zhou, and the king sent him an official invitation to the court. When Gong Yi Bai arrived, they looked at his physique and saw that it was of a weakling. Perplexed, King Zhuan asked, How strong are you? Gong Yi Bai said, I'm strong enough to break a grasshopper's leg and lift a cicada's wing. The king flushed and said, I'm strong enough to rip a rhinoceros hide and drag nine bulls by the tail, yet still reproach myself for weakness. Why are you famous all over the land for strength when you are only able to break a grasshopper's leg and lift cicada's wings? Gong Yi Bai sighed and shrank back from his seat, saying, Good question, Majesty. I will now be so presumptuous as to tell the truth. I had a certain master, Shang Chu, as my teacher. His strength was unmatched in all the land, yet unknown even to his family and relatives, because he never used it. I worked for him faithfully, and finally he told me, if people want to see the unseen, let them look at what others don't observe. If they want to attain the unattainable, let them practice what others do not. So those who would learn to see, first look at cartloads of kindling. Those who learn to hear, first listen to giant bells. Those who have ease within, there is nothing difficult outside. Because there is nothing difficult for them outside, their repute doesn't get out of their own homes. Now, my repute among the lords is because I've disobeyed my teacher's instruction and have revealed my true power. Nevertheless, my reputation isn't due to my pride in my strength, but my ability to use my strength. Isn't this better than those who take pride in strength? Prince Mo of Zongshan was a sage-like duke from the state of Wei. He enjoyed the company of the logician Gong Sun Long. The disciples of the conventionalist Wei Zhang Ji Yu laughed at this, and the Prince Mo asked him, Why do you laugh at my fondness for the company of Gong Sun Long? Zi Yu said, it's Gong Sun's character. His conduct has no guidance. His learning has no associates. He is glib but misses the point. He is uncommitted and unaffiliated. He has a penchant for oddities and likes to tell tales. He wants to confuse people and to silence them. He exercises this with the likes of Han Tan. Prince Mo's expression changed. He said, How do you characterize Gong Sun's faults? I'd like to hear the truth. Ji Yu said, I laugh at Gong Sun's preposterous statements to Kong Quan, that a good archer can hit the back of one arrow with the point of the next arrow shot, shot after shot striking the last, but that the first arrow is still sticking out in a straight line, without falling, while the last arrow is still on the bowstring. Kong Quan was astonished by this, but Gong Sun said, This is not yet marvelous. Once the disciple of an expert archer got mad at his wife, and in order to scare her, he took a powerful bow and a well-crafted arrow and shot at her eyes. The arrow came right at the pupil of her eye, but she didn't even blink. The arrow fell to the ground without raising dust. Are these indeed the words of a wise man? Prince Mo asked, The words of a man of wisdom are not understood by the ignorant, to be sure. When each following arrow strikes the one before it, that's a matter of aligning the following with the foregoing. When an arrow is aimed at someone's eye, and yet she doesn't blink, that means that the momentum of the arrow is used up. How can you wonder? Ji Yu said, You are a follower of Gong Sun. How could you but cover up his flaws? I'll tell you one even worse. Gong Sun buffaloed the king of Wei, saying, Having intention negates mind. Having a goal negates arrival. There is something that does not come to an end. There is a shadow that does not move. Hair can pull a ton. A white horse is not a horse. An orphan calf never had a mother. 
His contradictions and perversions are too numerous to tell. Prince Mo asked, You think excellent words preposterous because you don't understand them. You are one who's preposterous. You see, when there are no intentions, then minds are the same. When there is no goal, everyone's arrived. That which causes things to come to an end always exists. The reason a shadow doesn't move is that each shift is a new shadow. Hair can pull a thousand pounds because the stress is evenly distributed. A white horse is not a horse in terms of disparity between appearance and name. An orphan calf never had a mother, because if it had a mother, it isn't an orphan calf. Ji Yu said, You rationalize everything Gong Sun Long crows. You take him seriously, even if he talked through his ass, saying, Yes sir, as if he farted. Yao governed his land for 50 years, but didn't know if the land was actually orderly or not, or if the masses supported him or not. He asked his closest advisor, but they didn't know either. He asked the outer circle at court, but they didn't know either. He asked the educated who held no office, but they also didn't know. Yao then dressed in humble clothing and roamed the streets. He heard a child singing, The establishment of our people is all your achievement, unconsciously and unknowingly following the laws of heaven. Delighted, Yao asked, Who taught you this? The child said, I heard it from a nobleman. So he asked the nobleman. The noble said, it's an ancient song. Yao returned to his palace, summoned Shun, and ceded the land to him. Shun accepted without refusing. The keeper of the past said, Don't dwell on yourself, and all things will be clear. Like water in movement, like a mirror in stillness, like an echo in response, the Tao is thus in harmony with people. People deviate from the Tao on their own. The Tao does not deviate from people. Those who harmonize well with the Tao don't need their eyes or ears don't use their strength or mind. If you want to harmonize with the Tao, but seek it by means of looking and listening, and of formal learning, you'll never find it. When you look at what lies ahead, but suddenly it's behind, try to use it, and it fills the universe. Try to dismiss it, and no one knows where it is. The mindful cannot alienate it. The mindless cannot approach it. The ones who attain it, realize it silently, and actualize it naturally. Knowledge without subjectivity, Capability without artifice, these are true knowledge, true ability. If you try to arouse the insensate, how can it feel? If you try to arouse the inert, how can it act? If it is a mass of matter, a conglomeration of particles, even if it does nothing, that is not the principle. Book 5. The Questions of Tang Tang of Yin questioned Ji Sha saying, In the beginnings of antiquity, did individual things exist? He suspected that there was only chaos, and nothing more. If things did not exist then, replied Xia, how can they be in existence now? Or, will the men of future ages be right in denying the existence of things in the present time? Things in that case, pursued Tong, have no before nor after? Xia replied, In the beginning and end of things there is no precise limit. Beginning may be end, and end may be beginning. How can we conceive of any fixed period to either? That which we call an end, at the present moment, may be the beginning of a new thing, and that which we call the beginning may, on the contrary, be the end of something. Beginning and end succeed one another, until at last they cannot be distinguished. But, when it comes to something outside matter in space, or before the events in our time, our knowledge fails us. Then. Upwards and downwards, and in every direction space is infinite quantity? Xia replied, I don't know. It is not so much that he did not know, but that it's unknowable. Tong asked the question again, but with more insistence. Xia said, If there is nothing in space, then it is infinite. If there is something, then that something must have limits. How can I tell which is true? But beyond infinity, there must again exist non-infinity. And within the unlimited again, that which is not unlimited. Tong continued his inquiries, saying, What is beyond the four seas? Xia replied, Just what there is here now in the province of Qi. How can you prove that? asked Tong. When traveling eastwards, said Xia, I came to the land of Ying, where the inhabitants are no wise different than those from this country. I inquired about the neighbors east of Yin. 
and I found that they, too, were similar to their neighbor. Traveling westwards, I came to Pin, where the inhabitants were similar to our own countrymen. I inquired to the countries west of Pin, and found that they were again quite similar to Pin. That is how I know that the regions within the four seas, the four wildernesses, and four utmost ends of the earth are none wise different from the country that we ourselves inhabit. Thus, the lesser is always enclosed by a greater, without ever reaching an end. Heaven and earth, which enclose the myriad objects of creation, are themselves enclosed in some great outer shell. That which contains heaven and earth is the great void. Enclosing heaven and earth and the myriad objects within them, this great outer shell is infinite and immeasurable. How do we know but that there is some mightier universe in existence beyond our own? That is a question to which we can give no answer. Heaven and earth, then, are themselves only material objects, and therefore imperfect. Hence, it is that qua of old-fashioned many-colored blocks of stone to repair the defective parts. Nu qua, being a divine man, was able to refine and extract the essence of the five constituents of matter. He cut off the legs of the Ao, the great turtle of the sea, and used them to support the four corners of the heavens. Later on, Kung Kung fought with Chun Shu for the throne, and blundering in his rage against Mount Pu Cho, he snapped the pillar which connects heaven and earth at the northwest corner. That is why heaven dips downward to the northwest, so that the sun, moon, and stars travel to that quarter. And earth, on the other hand, is now not large enough to fill up the southeast. That is why the rivers and streams all roll in that direction. The two mountains, Tai Xing and Wang Wu, which cover an area of 700 square miles, and rise to an enormous altitude, originally stood to the south of the Qi district and north of Ho Yang. The man named Simpleton of the North Mountain, an old man of 90, dwelled opposite these mountains, and was vexed in spirit because their northern flank blocked ways for travelers, who had to go all the way around the mountains. So he called his whole family together in his small home and broached a plan. Let us, he said, put forth our utmost strength to clear this obstacle, and cut right through the mountains until we come to Han Yin. What say you, my friends? They all assented to his plan, except his wife, who made objections and said, My good man has not the strength to sweep away a dunghill, let alone the mounts Tai Xing and Wang Wu. Besides, where will you put all the earth and stones you dig up? The others replied that they would throw some from the promontory of Po Hai. So, the old man followed by his son and grandson, sallied forth with their pickaxes, and the three of them began hewing away at rocks, and cutting up the soil, and carting it away in baskets to throw it off the promontory of Po Hai. A widowed woman, who was living near, had a little boy who, though he was young and just shedding his milk teeth, came skipping along to give them what help he could. Engrossed in their toil, they never went home except once at the turn of the season. The wise old man of the river bend burst out laughing and urged the whole family to stop. Great indeed is your witlessness, he said. With the poor remaining strength of your declining years, you, sir, will not succeed in removing a hair's breadth of that mountain, much less the whole vast mass of rock and soil. With a sigh, the old simpleton of the North Mountain replied, Surely it is you who are narrow-minded and unreasonable. You are not to be compared with this widow's son. Despite his insignificant strength, though I myself must die, I leave a son behind me, and through him a grandson, and that grandson will beget sons in his turn, and those soils will also have sons and grandsons. With all this progeny, my line will not die out, while on the other hand, this mountain will not receive either increment or addition. Why then should I despair of leveling it to the ground at last? The wise man of the old river bend had nothing to say in reply. One of the old serpent-brandishing deities, heard of the undertaking, in fear it might never actually be finished, went and told the great spirit Shangdi, who was touched by the old simple man's faith, and commanded the two sons of the august god, Kwa O, to transport the mountains, one to the extreme northeast, the other to the southern corner of Yong, to the southwest, that is, as far as possible. Ever since then, the region lying between Qi in the north and Han in the south has been an unbroken plain, roughly the province of Hunan. Father Kwa, not asserting his own strength, wanted to chase the sunlight, 
and pursued it to the horizon. When he got thirsty, he drank up the Yellow River and the Way River. The Yellow River and the Way River weren't sufficient, so he headed north to drink up the Great Lake. Before he arrived, however, he died of thirst on the way. The staff he left behind, infused with the fat and flesh of his body, spread in the Deng Forest. The Deng Forest is thousands of miles in size. You the Great said, The earth is illuminated by the sun and moon, regulated by the stars and planets, ordered by the four seasons, and corresponds to the planet Jupiter. The beings born of spirit differ in form. Some are quite short-lived, some are very long-lived. Only a sage can comprehend the true reason. Chi of Sha said, But there are those who were born of independent spirit, formed independent of yin and yang, illuminated independent of the sun and moon, short-lived without being killed, long-lived without being fostered, eat without needing grain, dress without needing cloth, travel without needing a vehicle. Their path is naturally so, also not comprehended by sages. While Yu was in the process of quelling the flood, he lost the way and went to a certain country by mistake. It was on the north edge of the northern ocean, untold thousands of miles from China. That country is called Ultimate North, and there's no telling where its boundaries were. There was no wind or rain, frost or dew, birds or beasts that lived there, no insects or fish, no plants or trees. It was completely flat in all four directions, and ringed by huge mountain ranges. There was a mountain in the middle, called Bottle Neck, shaped like a bottle, of course, with a round mouth on the top, called Opening of Nourishment, from which flowed a kind of water called Miraculous Spring Water, most fragrant and quite delicious. This one spring, divided into four streams flowing down the mountain, circulating throughout the whole country, reaching everywhere. The climate was mild, and there was no disease. The people were, by nature, genial and agreeable, not competitive or contentious. They had soft hearts and weak bones. They were not arrogant and not envious. Older and younger lived as equals, neither ruling nor subjected. Males and females associated freely, without matchmaking or marriage. They lived by the water, without plowing or planting. The climate was mild and agreeable, so they didn't spin and didn't wear clothes. They died when they were a hundred years old, never dying young or falling ill. The people multiplied there prolifically, and the population was huge beyond number. They had joy and pleasure, without sorrow or pain, or deterioration of age. Their custom was to enjoy singing. In groups of them, they would take turns singing all day long. When they got tired or hungry, they would drink from this miraculous spring water, and they'd be refreshed in body and mind. If they drank too much, they'd be intoxicated, and would take ten days to sober up. When they bathed in the miraculous spring water, their skin became lustrous and fragrant for ten days. When King Mu of Zhou journeyed north, he passed through that country, and forgot to return for three years. When he did get back to the house of Zhou, he longed for that country so much that he became distracted and absent-minded. He didn't partake in wine or meat, and didn't call for his concubines. It was months before he came back to himself. When Guan Zhong urged Duke Huan of Qi to make that distant journey with him to that country, when they were about to get underway, Ji Peng objected. Your lordship is leaving the immensity of the state of Qi, the enormity of its population, the beauty of its mountains and rivers, the abundance of its plants, the maturity of its rights and principles, the aesthetics of its formal attire, the beautiful women filling this palace, the loyal men filling the court. You can muster a million troops with a shout. You can order about the lords by just giving them a look. So, what can you possibly find so attractive about that place that you'd abandon your homeland for this northern foreign country? This fellow, Guan Zhang, is senile. How can you go along with him? So, Du Quan took up the idea and told Guan Zhang what Ji Peng had said. Guan Zhang said, This is definitely beyond Ji Peng. I'm afraid it's uncertainty about that country. Why be attached to the wealth of Qi? Why pay attention to the words of Ji Peng? People in southern countries cut their hair and go naked. People in northern countries wear turbans and leather garments. People in temperate countries wear hats and clothing of fabric. As for what the Nine Lands provide, some are of agriculture, some commercial, some are hunters, and some are fishermen. Like wearing leather in winter and silk in summer, traveling by boat on water, or by cart on land. It goes without saying, turning out that way naturally. East of Yue, 
There is a country called Zhe Mu, where they dismember and eat their firstborn, thinking that will enable them to have many sons. When their grandfathers die, they carry their grandmothers off and abandon them, saying, the wife of a ghost can't live with us. South of Chu, there is a country called Yan Ran, where their parents die, they strip off the flesh and bury the bones. Only then, they can be considered filial sons. West of Qin, there is a country called Yi Chu. When their parents die, they pile up firewood and cremate them. As the smoke rises, they call this going to heaven. Then, they qualify as loyal sons. Made into policies by rulers, these are made into customs by subjects, so nothing to wonder at. When Confucius was traveling in the east, he saw two children arguing and asked what it was about. The one child said, I think the sun is closer to us when it rises, and further away at noon. The other child thought that the sun was further away when it rises, and closer at noon. The first child said, when the sun first rises, it's as big as a parasol, and at noon, it's the size of a disc. Isn't this because things farther away seem smaller, and things nearby seem bigger? The other child said, It's cool at sunrise, but hot at midday. Isn't this because it's hotter when the sun is nearer, and cooler when it's farther? Confucius couldn't decide. The children laughed at him, both saying, Who says you know anything about anything? Equilibrium is the ultimate principle of Earth. Everything in the dormant form is thus. Hairs of equal length will bear weight hung equally on them. If the weight on them is different, and they snap, it means that the hairs are not equal in length. If they are equal, then those would otherwise snap do not break. People think it is not so, but there have naturally been those who have realized it so. Jean He made a fishing line out of a single strand of silk, used a prickle from a beard of grain for a hook, took a cane from dwarf bamboo for a rod, and split a grain of rice for bait. This is when he caught a cartload of fish from the depth of a hundred fathoms, casting it into the current without the line snapping, the hook straightening, or the rod bending. The king of Chu heard of this and considered it a true marvel. He summoned the fisherman and asked him how he did it. Jean He said, I heard my father speak of the archery of an ancient bird hunter. Using arrows with strings attached, he used a weak bow and a delicate string, but he shot it in the wind, begging a pair of orioles at the edge of blue clouds. He focused his attention undivided, and he moved his hands in balance. I learned fishing by imitating that example. It took me five years to master this method, but when I'm at the riverside holding my fishing pole, there is no random thoughts in my mind, only the thoughts of fish. When I cast my line and sink my hook, there's no resistance in my hand, so nothing can cause me disturbance. Fish see the bait on my hook like sinking dust or a bunch of froth, and swallow it without any hesitation. Thus. I control strength by weakness. I bring the heavy by the means of the light. If your master can really govern a country like this, then the empire could be operated with simply one hand. What else would you have to do? Kung Hu of Lu and Qi Ying of Chao both fell ill at the same time and called in aid from the great Pian Chao. Pian Chao cured them, and when they were well again, he told them that the malady that they had been suffering from was one that attacked the eternal organs from without, and for one, the reason was curable by the application of vegetable and mineral drugs. But, he said, each of you is also a victim of a genetic disease, which has grown along within the body. Would you like me now to grapple with this? They said, yes, but ask to hear the diagnosis first. Pian Chao turned to Kung Hu. Your mental powers, he said, are strong but your willpower is weak. Hence, though fruitful in plans, you lack decision. Qi Ying's mental powers, on the other hand, are weak, while his willpower is very strong. Hence, when there is want of forethought, and he is placed at a disadvantage by the narrowness of his aim, now I can effect a change of hearts between you. The good will be equally balanced by both. That is, Kung Hu, who has the weaker character, will get a weaker brain to match while Qi Ying, with a stronger will, receives a stronger mind to direct it. Though it may be that Qi Ying has the best of this bargain, each man, under this new arrangement, will be at any rate perfectly and succinctly well balanced. So saying, Pian Chao administered each of them a potion of medicated wine, which threw them into a death-like trance that lasted for three days. Then, making the incision in each of their chests, he took out the heart of one man, and place it in the other. 
poulticing the wounds with herbs of marvelous efficiency. When the two men regained their consciousness, they looked exactly the same as before, and taking their leave, they returned home. Only, it was Kung Hu who went to Qi Ying's house, where Qi Ying's wife and children did not recognize him, while Qi Ying went to Kung Hu's house and was not recognized either. This led to a lawsuit between the two families, and Pian Chao was called in as an arbitrator. On his explaining how the matter stood, peace was restored. When Pao Ba played the flute, birds dance and fish frolic. When the music master Wen of Zheng heard of this, he left home to follow music master Jiang. Tuning his instrument, he didn't play a piece for three years. Master Jiang said, you can go home. Master Wen sat aside his lute and lamented. It's not that I can't tune it, and not that I can't play a piece. What I have in mind is not in the strings. My intent is not in the sound. Inwardly, I can't find it in my mind. Outwardly, it doesn't resonate in the instrument, so I don't dare to try to play it. Give me a little more time to see what's next. In no time at all, he came back to see Music Master Jiang. Master Jiang said, How is your instrument? Master Wen said. I've got it. Here's a sample for you. At that time it was spring, and he plucked the metallic notes to evoke the key of autumn. Thereupon a cool breeze suddenly came, and the fruits of the plants and the trees were fully developed. Come autumn, he plucked the notes to produce a key of spring, and the warm breeze slowly swirled, and the plants and trees burst into bloom. In summer, he plucked the water notes to produce the key of winter, whereupon frost and snow fell, the rivers and lakes froze. When winter came, he plucked the fire notes to produce the key of summer, whereupon sunlight burned fiercely and solid ice melted instantly. As he was concluding, he played all four strings of the designated seasons, and an auspicious breeze swirled, felicitous clouds floated, sweet dew descended, and delicious springs bubbled up. Impressed, Master Zhang said with enthusiasm, Your play is refined indeed. Even the pure notes of Master Guang and the pitch of Zhou Yan have nothing to add to this. They would simply have to pack up their instruments and follow after you. Mr. Tan of Zhui studied singing with Qing of Qin. Thinking he'd master Qing's art before he really had, Tan took leave to go back home. Qing didn't try to stop him, but as a parting gift at the highway, outside the city he sang a sad song. His voice made the trees in the forest vibrate, the resonance halted passing clouds. Now, Tan of Zhui apologized and sought to return, never presuming to speak of going back home for the rest of his life. Qing of Qin turned and said to his companions, Long ago, when A e of Hun went east to Qi, she ran out of supplies, so she passed the gateway of harmony into Qi. She sold songs for food. After she'd gone, lingering notes wound around the roof beams for three whole days, so people around her thought she hadn't left. She went by a tavern, but the people at the tavern insulted her, so A e of Han cried, mournfully, in long, drawn-out notes. Everyone in the neighborhood, old and young, was saddened. Looking at each other with tears in their eyes, they couldn't eat for three days. Finally, they went after her. A e came back and sang again, drawing out the notes, a long song. Everyone in the neighborhood, old and young, jumped for joy, clapping and dancing, unable to restrain themselves, forgetting their earlier sadness. Then, they saw her off with plenty of gifts. For this reason, the people at the Gate of Harmony are good at singing and keening to this day, emulating the tradition left by the voice of A. Bo Ya was good at playing the lute. Zhang Zhi Zhi was good at listening. When Bo Ya played the lute with his mind on climbing high mountains, Zhang said, Wow, high at Mount Tai. When Bo Ya's mind was on flowing water, Zhang said, Wow, vast as the Yangtze and Yellow River. Whatever Bo Ya thought of, Zhang would always just get it. When Bo Ya journeyed to the north peak of Mount Tai, he suddenly got caught in a storm and stayed under a cliff. Feeling melancholy, he played his lute. At first, he composed a lamenting song on the continuous rain. Then, he recreated the sound of an avalanche. When he performed each of these pieces, Zhang comprehended their sense at once. Bo Ya then put down his lute and said with a sigh, Your listening is very skillful indeed. The intent 
conception, and image are like my mind. Where can I conceal my voice? King Mu of Zhou made a tour of inspection to the west. He crossed the Kunlun Range and turned back before he reached the Yen Mountains, called the Place Where the Sun Sets. On his return journey, before arriving in China, a certain artificer was presented to him, named Yen Shi. King Mu received him in audience, and asked what he could do. I will do anything, replied Yen Shi, that your master may please to command. But there is a piece of work, yes, already finished, that I should like to submit first to your majesty's inspection. Bring it with you tomorrow, said the king, and we will look at it together. So Yen Shi called the next day, and was duly admitted to the royal presence. Who is that man accompanying you? asked the king. That, sire, is my handiwork. He can sing, and he can act. The king stared at the figure in astonishment. It walked in rapid strides, moving its head up and down, so anyone could have taken it for an actual live human being. The artificer touched his chin, and it began to sing, perfectly in tune. He touched the thing's hand, and it started posturing, keeping perfect time. It went through any number of movements that fancy might happen to dictate. The king, looking at his own favorite concubine and other inmates of his harem, could hardly persuade himself that it was not real. As the performance was drawing to an end, the automaton winked his eye and made sundry advances towards the lady in attendance to the king. This, however, threw the king into a great passion, and he would have put Yen Shi to death on the spot had not the latter, in mortal terror, instantly pulled the automaton to pieces to let him see what it really was. And lo, it turned out to merely be a conglomeration of leather, wood, glue, and paint, colored white, black, red, and blue. Examining it closely, the king found all the internal organs were complete. Liver, gall, heart, lungs, spleen, kidneys, stomach, and intestines. And, all over these again, muscles and bones, and limbs with their true joints, skin and teeth and hair, all of them artificial, not a part but was fashioned with the utmost nicety and skill. And when the thing was put back together again, the figure presented the same appearance when it first brought in. The king tried to effect of taking away the heart, and found that the mouth would no longer utter a sound. He took away the thing's liver, and the eyes could no longer see. He took away the kidneys, and the legs lost their power. Now, the king was delighted. Drawing a deep breath, he exclaimed, Can it really be that human skill is really on par with that of heaven's creation? And forthwith, he gave an order to two extra chariots, in which he took home him, the artificer, and his machine. Now, Pan Shu, with his cloud-scaling ladder, and Mo Ti, with his flying kite, thought they had reached the limits of human achievement. Pan Shu had made a cloud ladder, which he could mount the sky, and assail the heights of heaven. Mo Ti made a wooden kite, which would fly for three days without coming down. But when Yen Shi's wonderful piece of work had been brought to their knowledge, the two inventors never again ventured to boast of their mechanical skill, and ceased to busy themselves so frequently with the square, compass, and pen. Gan Ying was an expert archer of old, when he drew his bows, animals would lay prostrate, and birds would come down. His disciple, Fei Wei, studied archery with Gan Yi, and his skill surpassed his teacher. A certain Ji Chang then studied archery with Fei Wei. Fei Wei told him, First, learn not to blink. Then we can talk about archery. Ji Chang went home and lay face up under his wife's loom, such that his eyes were in line with the threadle. For two years, he wouldn't blink even with an awl poking at his wide-open eye. He went and told Fei Wei. Fei Wei said, Not yet. Now you'll have to learn looking. Tell me when you see the small as if it were the large, and to see the minute as if it were distant. Chong hung a louse by the hair in his window, and looked at it facing south. In ten days, it gradually grew larger. After three years, it seemed as big as a cartwheel. Now, when he looked at other things this way, they were all mountainous. Then, using a horn bow and a cane arrow, he shot that louse through the head without snapping a thread on which it hung. He told Fei Wei about this. Fei Wei enthusiastically said, You've got it! Now that Ji Chang had mastered Fei Wei's art, 
he reckoned that he was the only one in the world who could actually rival Fai Wei. So, obviously, he plotted to kill Fai Wei. Meeting in an open field, the two men shot at each other. Their arrow points met in mid-air, and the arrows fell to the ground, yet the dust didn't stir. Fai Wei ran out of arrows first. Ji Chang had only one arrow left. He shot it, but Fai Wei stopped it with the tip of a thorn, with perfect accuracy. Now, the two masters threw down their bows, weeping and bowing at each other on the road. Adopting each other as father and son, they made a solemn oath never to teach this art to anyone else. The charioteer, Zhao Fu's teacher, was Mr. Tai To. When Zhao Fu began to learn chariot driving from him, he was strictly courteous and very humble. But Mr. Tai To didn't tell him anything for three years. Zhao Fu became even more punctilious in his manners, until Mr. Tai To finally told him, an ancient poem says, The son of a good bow maker must first make baskets. The son of a good smith must first make bellows. First, watch me run. When you can run like me, then you can hold six bridles and control six horses. Tai To then set up wooden posts, each just big enough for a foot, placed at a pace apart. Stepping on these, he ran back and forth without stumbling or slipping. Zhao Fu practiced this and mastered his skill in three days. Mr. Taito praised him. How adroit you are. You've got it so quickly. Charioteering is also like this. As you were running just now, you found it in your feet, responding to it in your mind. Applying this to charioteering, you equalize the team at the border of the bridle a bit, adjust the speed where the lips join, regulate measure at the center of the chest, and keep pace with your grip. By mastering it inwardly in the innermost mind, while outwardly according with the will of the horses, it is thus possible to go back and forth on a straight line, turn around with precision, and go long distances with energy to spare, having truly attained the art. What you feel in that bit responds with the bridle. What you feel in the bridle responds with your hands. What you feel in your hands respond to it with your mind. Then, you don't use your eyes to look. Don't use your whip to drive. Your mind is at ease. Your body upright. The six bridles don't tangle. Twenty-four hooves don't miss a step. Wheeling around, going back and forth, are all perfectly in order. After that, even if the track is no wider than your wheels, and there's no ground beyond your horse's hooves, you never sense the steepness of the mountains or the valleys, or the flatness of the plains in the swamp. Seeing them as one, this is the consummation of my art, and take good note of it. Lei Wan of Wei had a secret grudge against Chu Ping Chan, for which he slew him, and Lai Tan, the son of Chu Ping Chan, plotted vengeance against his father's enemy. Lai Tan's spirit was very fierce, but his body was very small. You could count the grains of rice that he ate, and he was at the mercy of every gust of wind. For all the anger in his heart, he was not strong enough to take revenge in an open fight, and he was ashamed to seek help from others. So he swore that, sword in hand, he would cut Hei Luan's throat in his sleep. Now this Hei Luan was the most ferocious character of his day, and his brute strength was much matched for a hundred men. His bones and sinews, skin and flesh, were cast from a superhuman mold. He could stretch out his neck to a blade or bare his chest to an arrow, but the sharp steel would bend or break, and his body would show no scar from an impact. Trusting his native strength, he looked disdainfully upon Lai Tan as a mere baby bird. Lai Tan had a friend, Xian To, who said to him, You have a bitter feud against Hei Luan, and Hei Luan treats you with contempt. What is your plan of action? Shedding tears, Lai Tan besought his friend's counsel. Well, said Shen To, I know that Kung Chao of Wei is inherited, through a long ancestor, a sword formerly possessed by the Yin emperors, of such magical power that a mere boy wielding it can put flight to the embattled hosts of an entire army. Why not sue for a loan of this sword? Acting on his advice, Lai Tan betook himself to the Kingdom of Wei and had an interview with Kung Cho. Following the usage of supplications, he first went through a ceremony of handing over his wife and children, and then stated his request. I have three swords, replied Kong Cho, but none of them can kill a man. You may choose the one you like first. However, let me describe their qualities. This first sword I have is called Light Absorber. 
It is invisible to the eye, and when you swing it, you cannot tell that there is anything there. Things struck by this sword retain an unbroken surface, and it will pass through a man's body without him knowing it. Now this second sword is called Shadow Receiver. If you face north and examine it at the point of dawn, when darkness melts into light, or in the evening, when day gives way to dusk, it appears misty and dim as though there were something there, the shape of which is not discernible. Things struck by it give a low sound, and it passes through men's body without causing them pain. The third is called Night Tempered, because in broad daylight, you only see its outline, and not the brightness of its blade. While at night, you see not the sword itself, but the dazzling light in which it reflects. The objects which it strikes are cleft through with a sibilant sound, but the line of cleavage closes up immediately, there is pain felt, but no blood remains on the blade. Now these three precious heirlooms have been handed down for 13 generations, but have never actually seen use. They lie stored away in a box, the seals of which have never been broken. In spite of what you tell me, said Lython, I should like to borrow the third sword, Knight Tempered. Kong Cho then returned his wife and children to him, and they've passed it together for seven days. On the seventh day, in the dusk of the evening, he knelt down and presented the third sword, Knight Tempered, to Lai Tan, who received it with two low bows and went home. He chose the third sword because it could be both handled and seen. Grasping his new weapon, Lai Tan sought out his enemy and found him lying in a drunken stupor at the window of his house. He cut clean through the body in three places, between the neck and the navel, but Hei Luan was quite unconscious of it. Thinking he was dead, Lai Tan made off as fast as he could, and happening to meet Hei Luan's son at the door, he struck at him three times with the sword, but it was like hitting empty air. Hei Luan's son laughed. Why are you motioning at me like that in that silly way with your hand? It will be remembered then that the sword is invisible in daylight. Realizing at last the sword had no true power to kill a man, Lai Tan heaved a sigh and returned home. When Hei Luan recovered from the effects of his debauchery, he was angry with his wife. What do you mean by letting me exposed to the draft? He howled. It will give me a sore throat and aching pains in the small of my back. Why? Said his son. I am also feeling some pains in my body and stiffness in my limbs. Lai Tan, you know, he was here a while ago, meeting me at the door. Made three gestures. He seems somehow to have been the cause of it. How he hates us for sure. Thus, the improper use of divine weapons can only lead to ruin, and the feuding of families can only lead to embarrassment. When King Mu of Zhou made a major expedition against the peoples to the west, the peoples to the west presented him with a special dagger and a special cloth. The dagger was just 18 inches long, made of tempered steel with a red edge. It could cut through jade like cutting through mud. As for the cloth, it could be put in a fire to be laundered, the cloth would turn the color of fire, while the grime would turn the color of the cloth. When taken out of the fire and shaken, the cloth would be white as snow. The crown prince thought that there were no such things, and that one who told them was mistaken. Zhao Shu said, The prince is ultimately fixated on his own belief, consequently repudiating truth. Book 6. Effort and Destiny Effort said to Destiny, your achievements are not equal to mine. Pray what do you achieve in the working of things, replied Destiny, that you would compare yourself with me. Why, said Effort, the length of a man's life, his measure of success, his rank, his wealth, are all things that I have the power to determine. To this, Destiny made the reply. Peng Su's wisdom did not exceed that of Yao and Shun, yet he lived to the age of 800 years. Yen Yuan's ability was not inferior to that of the average man, yet he died at the early age of only 32. The virtue of Confucius was not less than that of the feudal princes, yet he was graced to soar straits between Chen and Tsai. The conduct of the Chou and of the Yin dynasty did not surpass that of the three men of virtue, yet he occupied a kingly throne. Wei Tzu, Qi Tzu, and Pai Khan are all relatives to Chu Xin, by whose orders the last named was disemboweled. Qi Cha would not accept the overlordship of Wu, while Tian Hung usurped sole power in Qi. Po Ai and Shu, Qi starved to death at Shouyang, 
while Qi Shi waxed rich at Changqin. If these results were compassed by your efforts, how is it that you allotted long life to Pang Tzu, and an untimely death to Yan Yuan, that you awarded discomfiture to the sage, and success to the impious, humiliation to the wise men, and high honors to the fool, poverty to the good, and wealth to the wicked? If, as you say, rejoined Effort, I really have no control over events, is it not then owing to your mismanagement that things turn out the way they do. Destiny replied, The very name, Destiny, show that there can be no question of management in the case. When the way is straight, I push on. When it is crooked, I put up with it. Old age and early death, failure and success, high rank and humble station, riches and poverty, all these come naturally and of themselves. How can I know anything about them? Being what it is, Without knowing why, that is the meaning of destiny. What room is there for management here? Bei Gongji said to Ji Menji, We are peers, but you are the one people have helped to succeed. We are of the same clan, yet you are the one the people respect. We are of similar appearance, yet you are the one people admire. We are equally eloquent, yet you are the one people employ. Our conduct is the same, yet you are the one people trust. Our offices are equal, yet you are the one people hold to honor. Our farms are equal, yet you are the one people enrich. Our commerce is equal, yet you are the one people profit. I wear the poor clothes, I eat simple food, I live in a reed cottage, I travel on foot, I wear brochade, I eat polished rice and filleted meat, I live in a big house, and travel with a team and four horses. At home, you gladly ignore me. At court, you plainly show contempt for me. It's been years since we visited one another. Do you think that your virtue is superior to mine? Jimen Zi said, I have no way to know whether that's true, but you fail at things while I succeed. Isn't this evidence of disparity in our endowments? Yet you consider yourself equal to me in every way. You're certainly brazen. Bei Gongji had no reply. He went home dejected. On the way, he met Master Dong Guo. The master said, Here you have been that you are now returning, walking home alone with that look of profound shame. Bei Gongji told him what had happened. Master Dong Guo said, I will relieve your shame. I'll go back to Ji Menzi with you and question him. Master Dong Guo said to Ji Menzi, Tell me, why did you humiliate Bei Gongji so deeply? Ji Menzi said, Bei Gongji said that he was equal to me in family status, age, appearance, speech, and conduct, yet different to me in rank and riches. I told him that I had no way of knowing the truth of the matter, but he fails at things where I succeed, and perhaps that is evidence of difference in endowment. So for him to say that he's any equal in anything is impudent on his part. Master Dong Guo said, When you speak of difference in endowment, you're only talking of differences in talent and virtue. The difference in endowment which I speak of is otherwise. Bei Gongzi is rich in virtue, poor in fate. You're rich in fate, but poor in virtue. Your success is not obtained by wisdom, while Bei Gongji's failures are not by way of mistakes due to failure. Both are from nature, not mankind. So your pride in richness and fate, in Bei Gongji's shame at richness of virtue, both fail to recognize a pattern of necessity. Ji Menzi said, Master, stop, I dare say no more. After Bei Gongji returned home, when he wore his cotton and wool clothing it was warm as leather and fur. When he ate his poor beans, they were tasty as polished rice. When he sheltered in his reed hut, it protected him like a mansion. When he rode his wicker cart, it was as fancy and glorious as a decorated carriage. At ease for the rest of his life, he was not aware of glory or disgrace in himself or in others. Hearing of this, Master Dong Guo said, Bei Gong Ji has been asleep for a long time, but he was able to wake up at a single statement. He was easily enlightened. Wan Yi Wu and Bao Shu Ya were both very close friends. They both lived in Qi. Wan Yi Wu attended the Duke's son, Ju, while Bao Shu Ya attended the Duke's son, Xiao Bo. There was quite a lot of favoritism in the clan of the Duke of Qi, while his sons by his wife and concubines had equal standing. The citizens feared of a civil war. Guan Yi Wu and Xiao Hu fled to Lu in service of the Duke's son, Ju, while Bao Shu Ya fled to Ju in the service of his duke's son, Xiaobo. Subsequently, Gongsun Wuji attempted a coup. 
Qi had no legitimate ruler, and the two sons of the dukes fought to take it over. Guan Yi Wu battled Zhao Bo in Zhu, during the course of which he shot an arrow that hit Zhao Bo's belt buckle. After Zhao Bo had been established as Duke Huan, he intimidated Lu into killing his brother, Zhuo. Xiao Hu committed suicide on that account. Guan Yi Wu was imprisoned. Bao Shu Ya said to Duke Huan, Guan Yi Wu is capable. He can govern a state. Duke Huan said, He is my enemy, and I want to kill him. Bao Shu Ya said, I have heard that the intelligent ruler has no private grudges. If someone can work for his employer, he can certainly work for his ruler. If you want hegemony or kingship, you cannot succeed without Yi Wu. You must release him immediately. In the end, the duke called for Yi Wu, and the state of Lu returned to him the state of Qi. Bao Shu Ya greeted him outside the city, and removed his shackles. Duke Huan treated him with courtesy, and put him in a higher position than the leading Gao and Guo families. Bao Shu Ya subordinated himself to him. Entrusted with the administration of the state, he was dubbed Father Zhong. Duke Huan subsequently became the overlord. Guan Zhong said in praise, When I was in straits in my youth, Bao Shu and I were both business partners. When it came to dividing the money, I gave more to myself, but Bao Shu didn't consider me greedy because he knew I was poor. When I used to plan enterprises for Bao Shu, I went bankrupt, but Bao Shu didn't consider me stupid. Because he knows that times may be opportune or inopportune, I served in office three times, and was discharged all three times by my ruler. Yet Bao Shu didn't consider me unworthy, because he knew my time hadn't come. I went to war three times, and fled all three times. Yet Bao Shu didn't consider me a coward, because he knew that I had an elderly mother to take care of. When the duke's son, Zhu, was destroyed, and Xiao Hu committed suicide on this account, I accepted imprisonment in disgrace, but Bao Shu didn't consider me shameless, because he knew that instead of me being ashamed over a minor sense of duty, I was ashamed of not being distinguished throughout the land. The ones who gave me life were my parents, but the one who truly knows me is Bao Shu Ya. With this, it was customary to cite Guan and Bao as examples of skill in association, and Xiao Bo as an example of skill in employing the capable. But there was not really skill in association, really no skill in employing the capable. Yet it is not that there is greater skill in association, not that there is greater skill in employing the capable. Xiao Hu did not commit suicide by virtue of his capability, he had no choice but to die. Bao Shu Ya did not recommend a savant by virtue of his own competence, but he had no choice but to recommend a savant. Xiao Bo did not employ an enemy because he was skillful, he had no choice but to employ an enemy. When Guang Zhang became ill, Xiao Bo inquired of him, Your illness is serious, Father Zhang, and may very well be fatal. And if you become critically ill, who should I entrust with the state? The sick man Guang Zhang said, What do you want? Xiao Bo said, Bao Shu Ya will do it. No, he won't. He is so puritanical that he won't associate with anyone unlike himself. And once he's heard of a fault in a person, he never forgets it all his life. If you let him administer the state, he'll be investigating the ruler above and imposing on the people below. It wouldn't be long before he's punished by the rulers. Xiao Bo said, Then, what will I do? If there's no alternative, then Ji Peng will do. He is the sort of man who superiors forget about, and who inferiors do not disobey. He is ashamed of not being comparable to the Yellow Emperor, and feels compassion to those who are not comparable to him. Those who distribute virtue to others are called sages. Those who distribute wealth to others are called savants. Those who use sage-like wisdom to lord over others have never won people. Those who use sage-like wisdom to humble themselves to others have never failed to win people's hearts. Regarding the state, there is that which they don't hear, and regarding the home, there is that which they don't see. There is no other choice. This Mr. Ji Pong will do. But Guan Yi Wu was not slighting Bao Shu Ya, but he could not slight him. He was not favoring Ji Pong, but he could not favor him. When you favor someone at first, you may wind up slighting them. When you slight someone at first, you may wind up favoring them. 
The going and the coming of favoring and slighting do not derive from oneself. Dong Shi manipulated ambiguous propositions to set forth inexhaustible rhetoric. He wrote the criminal code applied by the state of Zheng when Ji Chang was in charge of government. He repeatedly criticized Ji Chang's administration, and Ji Chang yielded to him. Then, Ji Chang had him arrested and disgraced, and executed soon. So, Ji Chang applied the criminal code, but not because he could, but because he had to. Dong Ji restrained Ji Chang, but not because he could, but because he had to. Ji Chang executed Dong Ji, but not because he could, but because he had to. To live when you can live is to be blessed from nature. To die when you should die is to be blessed from nature. Not living when you can live is a penalty from nature. Not dying when you should die is a penalty from nature. To be able to live and ready to die, then to live and to die, sometimes happens. To die when it's right to live, and to live when it's right to die, also sometimes happens. But that which gives life to the living, and death to the dying, is a not a thing, and not a self. It is all destiny, about which intelligence can do nothing. So it is said, mysterious and boundless, the course of nature organizes itself. Silent and undivided, the course of creation operates itself. Sky and earth cannot impinge upon it. A sage's knowledge cannot affect it. Ghosts and spirits cannot deceive it. That which is naturally so silent accomplishes it, balances it, and stabilizes it, sends it off, and welcomes it. Yang Chu had a friend called Qi Liang, who fell ill. In seven days' time, this illness had become very grave. Medical aid was summoned, and his son stood weeping around his bed. The sick man, Qi Liang, said to Yang Chu, Such excess of emotion shows my children to be degenerates. Will you kindly sing them something which will enlighten their minds? Yang Chu then chanted the following words. How can men be aware of things outside heaven's ken? Over misfortune men has no control, and can look for no help from heaven. Have doctors and shamans this knowledge that you and I have not? The sons, however, did not understand, and finally they called in three doctors. Dr. Chiao, Dr. Lu, and Dr. Yu. They all diagnosed his complaint, and Dr. Chiao delivered his first opinion. The hot and cold elements of your body, he said to Qi Liang, are not in harmonious accord, and the impermeable and funnel-shaped parts are mutually disproportionate. The origin of your sickness is traceable to disordered appetites, and the dissipation of your vital essence through worry and care. Neither heaven nor spirit is to blame. Although this sickness is grave, it is amenable to treatment. The sick man, Qi Liang said, you are one of the common ruck, and speedily he got rid of him. Then, Dr. Yu came forward and said, You were born with too little nervous force, and you were too freely fed with your mother's milk. Your illness is not that has developed in a manner of 24 hours. The causes which have led up to it are of a gradual growth. It is incurable. The sick man, Qi Liang, replied, You are a good doctor, and told them to give him some food. Lastly, Dr. Lu said, Your illness is attributable neither to heaven, nor to man, nor to the agency of spirits. It was already foreordained in the mind of providence when you were endowed with this bodily form at birth. What possible good can herbs and drugs do you? You are a heaven-born physician indeed, cried the sick man Qi Liang, and sent him away, laden with gifts. Not long after, Qi Liang's illness disappeared of itself. Life cannot be preserved by valuing it. The body cannot be taken care of by cherishing it. Life cannot be shortened by despising it, nor can the body be neglected by disregarding it. So, you may not survive even if you value life, and may not die even if you despise it. Cherishing the body may not take care of it, while disregarding the body may not be neglecting it. This seems contradictory, but it's really not. It's a matter of living naturally, and dying naturally, caring naturally, and neglecting naturally. Then again, you live life by valuing it, or you live by despising it. You may take care of it by cherishing it, or fall into neglect by disregarding it. This seems logical, but it is really not. This too is living naturally, and dying naturally, caring naturally, and neglecting it naturally. Yu Jong said to King Wen, 
Natural longevity is not an addition. Natural brevity is not a diminution. What is lost by calculating it? Lao Ron said to Keeper of the Pass, Who knows the reasons for creation's disapproval? So, it's better not to look to the divine will and try to figure out gain and loss. Yang Bu asked, There are people quite similar in age, property, talent, and appearance, yet quite different in longevity, status, reputation, and inclinations. I'm quite confused by this. Master Yang Zhu said, People of ancient times had this saying, I have memorized it, and I'll tell you. What is so, without anyone knowing, why it is so, is destiny. In the present obscurity and confusion, whatever is done or undone, the days come and go, but who can know the reason? It's all destiny. Those who trust destiny are oblivious of long life or early death. Those who trust intrinsic order are oblivious to affirmation or negation. Those who trust mind are oblivious to opposition and accord. Those who trust nature are oblivious to safety and danger. This is called being entirely oblivious of objects or disbelief. This is true. This is genuine. Why reject? Why embrace? Why lament? Why rejoice? Why act? And why refrain? The Book of the Yellow Emperor says, Perfected people are as if dead when at rest, like a machine in action. They don't even know why they're at rest, and don't even know why they're not at rest. They don't know why they act, and don't even know why they don't act. They don't change their inner states or outward appearances because people are watching. And they don't change their inner states or outward appearances because they think no one is watching. They come and go on their own. They appear and disappear on their own. Who can block their way? Four men named Ink Piss, fanatic, lazy, and hasty, traveled the world together, each by doing as he liked. In the end of their years, they never knew each other's state of mind, as each one thought his own wisdom the most profound. Tricky, simple, artless, and fawning traveled the world together, each doing as he liked. In the end of their years, they never spoke to each other, as each one thought his own skill the most subtle. Four men, named Withdrawn, Candid, Stammerer, and Scold, traveled the world together, each doing as he liked. In the end of their years, they never understood each other, so each one thought his own talent adequate. Four men, named Conman, Buckpasser, Bold, and Timid, traveled the world together, each doing as he liked. To the end of their years, they never criticized each other, because each one thought his own conduct unobjectionable. Four men, named Conformist, Individualist, Opportunist, and Independent, traveled the world together, each doing as he liked. To the end of their years, they never paid attention to each other, each one thinking himself in harmony with the times. There are a multiplicity of attitudes, they are not the same in appearance, but all are alike in saying it was their destiny. Fortuitous success seems like success, but is not at all success. Fortuitous failure seems like failure, but is not at all failure. So confusion produces semblance, and the boundaries of semblance are obscure. If you are not muddled in the midst of the seeming, then you are not alarmed by the external calamities and will not rejoice over internal blessings. Acting according to the time, inactive according to the time, you are inscrutable, even to the savants. Those who trust destiny do not have different attitudes towards others or the self, and those with different attitudes over other or the self would be better off covering their eyes and blocking their ears so they won't totter and fall over even if there's a cliff behind them and an empty moat in front of them. So it is said that death and life come from destiny. Poverty and riches depend on the times. Those who resent early death are those who do not know destiny. Those who resent poverty are those who do not know the times. To be unafraid in the face of death and undisturbed in straits is a matter of knowing destiny and resting content with the times. Suppose people with a lot of intelligence calculate gain and loss weigh falsehood and truth, and assess people's state of mind. They'll succeed half the time, and fail half the time. People with little intelligence don't calculate gain and loss. They don't weigh falsehood and truth, and don't assess people's states of mind. Yet they too succeed only half the time, and fail half the time. Calculating or not calculating, weighing or not weighing, assessing or not assessing, what's the difference? 
Only when there is nothing calculated, and nothing not calculated, is there completeness, without loss. Yet it is not a matter of completeness through knowledge, nor loss through knowledge. It is inherent completeness, spontaneous oblivion, and natural loss. Duke Qing of Qi was traveling across the northern flank of Ox Mountain in the direction of the capital. Gazing at the view before him, he burst into a flood of tears, exclaiming, What a lovely scene! How verdant and luxuriously wooded! To think someday I must die and leave my kingdom, passing away like running water. If only there were no such things as death, nothing could induce me to stir from this spot. Two of the ministers in attendance to the duke, taking their cue from him, also began to weep, saying, Who are we? We! who are dependent on your majesty's bounty, whose food is of an inferior sort, who ride on broken down hacks or in creaking carts. Even we do not want to die, how much less our sovereign liege. Yen Tzu, meanwhile, was standing nearby, with a broad smile on his face. The duke wiped away his tears and looked at Yen Tzu and said, Today, I am stricken with grief on my journey, and both Kong and Chu mingle their tears with mine. How is it that you alone can smile? Yen Tzu replied, If the worthy ruler were to remain in perpetual possession of a realm, Duke Tai and Duke Huan would still be exercising their sway. If the bold ruler were to retain perpetual possession, Duke Chuan and Duke Ling would still be ruling this land. If all these rulers are now in possession, where would your highness be? Why, standing in the furrowed fields, clad in a cloak and the hat of a peasant. You would be condemned to a hard life on earth. You would have no time, I warrant, for brooding over death. Again, why did you yourself come to occupy this throne? By a series of successive reigns and removals, until at last your turn came. And why are you alone going to weep and lament over this order of things? That is pure selfishness, sir. It was the sight of these two objects, a self-centered prince and his fawning attendants that sat me quietly laughing to myself just now. Duke Qing felt much ashamed. Raising his goblet of wine, he find himself one cup, and his obsequious courtiers, two cups of wine apiece. There was once a man, Tong Men Wu of Wei, who, when his son died, testified no grief. His house steward said to him, The love you bore your son could hardly be equal to any other parent in the world. Why then do you not mourn for him now that he is dead? There was a time, replied Tong Men Hu, when I had no son, yet I never had occasion to grieve on that account. Now that my son is dead, I am only in the same condition as I was before my son was born. What reason have I then to mourn? The husbandmen and the farmers take their measures according to the season. The trader occupies himself with gain. The craftsman strives to master his art. The official pursues power. Here, we have the operation of human forces of effort. But the husbandman has seasons of rain and seasons of drought. The trader meets with gains and loss, and the craftsman experiences both failures and success in his craft. The official finds opportunities, or the reverse. Here, we see the workings of destiny. Book 7 the Book of Yang Zhu. Yang Zhu traveled to Lu, where he lodged with the Meng family. Mr. Meng asked, People are just what they are. What's the use of reputation? Those who make use of reputation get rich. Once they've gotten rich, why don't they stop? They use it for status. Once they're respectable, why don't they stop? On account of death. Once they're dead, what's the use then? For their descendants. How can reputation benefit descendants? People undergo stress and strain for fame, but if they take advantage of it, the benefits extend to their clan. The advantages extend to neighbors and friends, how much more their direct descendants. Whoever strives for good results must be honest, but honesty means poverty. Whoever strives for good repute must be deferential, but to be deferential means to be low. When Guan Zhang was prime minister of Qi, he partied when the Lord partied, he lived in luxury when the Lord lived in luxury. United in mind, and concurring in speech, his policies were effective, and the state became dominant. But after he died, the Guan family died out. When Mr. Tian was Prime Minister of Qi, he humbled himself when the Lord was inflated. He was generous when the Lord was stingy. The people were all loyal to him, 
Because of this, he owned the state of Qi, and his descendants have enjoyed this all the way up to the present day. It seems that real fame leads to poverty, whereas artificial fame leads to wealth. Reality has no fame. Fame has no reality. Fame is entirely artificial. In ancient times, Yao and Shun pretended to abdicate to Zhu Yu and Shang Guan. But they didn't lose the realm. They reigned for a hundred more years. Bo Yi and Shou Qi really did abdicate the throne to Gu Zhu, and wound up losing the state and dying of starvation at Mount Shouyang. This is how clear the distinction between reality and falsehood must be. Yang Zhu said, The general limit of lifespan is a hundred years, but hardly one in a thousand actually lives to a hundred years. Even if there is one who does, nearly half of that time is taken up by infancy and senility. What is spent in sleep at night, or overlooked while awake by day, also take nearly half that man's life. Pain and sickness, sorrow and suffering, loss, worry, and fear also take up nearly half of what's left. Out of ten or so years of what's left over, figure how much is unburdened and content, with no preoccupying worries, not even an hour. So, what are people to do with their lives? What is there to enjoy? They strive for fine food and clothing, for music and beauties, but they cannot always be sated with fine food and clothing, and they cannot always be dallying with music and beauties. They are also inhibited and encouraged by penalties and rewards, controlling by conventions and laws. They compete restlessly for empty fame in their time, counting on continuing glory after death. They go on mining what their eyes and ears see and hear, caring only about what their bodies and minds approve or disapprove, missing out on supreme happiness of the present. They cannot be free, even for an hour. How is this different from being imprisoned or shackled like a slave? In high antiquity, people knew life as a temporary visit, and they knew death as a temporary journey. So they acted as they wished, not avoiding natural inclinations. They didn't reject personal pleasures, so they weren't motivated by reputation. Going along naturally, they did not oppose the predilections of myriad beings, and they did not grasp for fame after death, so they weren't affected by punishments. They did not calculate precedence of fame and name, or brevity, or length or brevity of life. Yang Zhu said, Myriad beings differ in life, but are the same in death. In life, there are the wise and the foolish, the noble and the debased. They differ in these. In death, there is the stench and rotting, decomposition and disintegration. They are the same in these. However, wisdom and folly, nobility and baseness are not under our control. Stench and rotting, decomposition, disintegration are not under our control either. So, Life is not something we produce. Death is not something we make fatal. Wisdom is not something we can make wise. Folly is not something we make foolish. Nobility is not something we make noble. And debaseness is not something we make base. Thus, myriad beings equally live and equally die, are equally wise and equally foolish, equally noble and equally debased. Some die in ten years, some die in a hundred, the humane and sagacitous die, and the cruel and ignorant also die. In life, there may be sage-like kings of Yao or Shun, but in death, there are rotting bones only. In life, there may be corrupt kings like Jie or Zhou, but in death, they are rotting bones only. The rotting bones are the same. Who can tell that they were different? So goes for the present life. Where is the leisure to consider what happens after death? Yang Zhu said, Bo Yi was not without desire. He was extreme in purism, which left him to starve to death. Lu Jia Hui was not without emotion. He was extreme in chastity, which left him quite few descendants. Such are the mistakes of purism and chastity. Yang Zhu said, Yuan Jian was imprisoned in Lu, while Zhi Gong grew rich in Wei. Yuan Jian's poverty shortened his life while Zhi Gong's wealth compromised his health. When neither poverty nor wealth is good, where is the good? Good is in enjoying life. Good is in avoiding stress. So those who are good at enjoying life don't go broke. Well, those who are good at avoiding stress don't get rich. Yang Zhu said, There is an ancient saying, Compassion in life, 
abandonment in death. The saying is perfect. The way of compassion is not merely emotion. Those who can toil put up at ease. The starving can be fed. The suffering from the cold can be kept warm. Those in straits can be fulfilled. The way of abandonment does not mean not mourning. It means not interring the dead with jewelry, not dressing in ornate brochade, not providing sacrificial animals, and not setting out funerary implements. Yan Ping Zhang asked Guan Yi Wu about keeping health. Guan Yi Wu said, Just do as you like, without inhibition or restraint. Yan Ping Zhang asked, What are the particulars? Guan Yi Wu said, Go ahead and listen to what your ears want to hear. Look at what your eyes want to see. Smell what your nose wants to smell. Say what you want to say. Make your body comfortable. Do as you will. Now then, what my ears want to hear is music. If they can't get to listen to it, that is called inhibited hearing. What my eyes want to see is beauty. If they can't get to see it, that's called inhibited vision. What the nose wants to smell is sweet fragrance. If they can't get to smell it, that is an inhibited sense of smell. What the mouth wants to express is judgment. If they can't say it, it's called inhibiting the intellect. What the body wants for comfort is good food and clothing. If it can't get them, that's called inhibiting ease. What the will wants to do is to be free. If it cannot, that is called inhibiting nature. These inhibitions are causes of destruction. Getting rid of causes and happily awaiting death is what I call keeping healthy. Even if for a day, a month, a year, or a decade, mired in these causes of destruction, bound up in them without relief, even if you live a long time sorrowfully, be it a century, a millennia, even a thousand years, that's not what I would call keeping healthy. Guan Yi Wu said, Now that I've told you about keeping healthy, what about sending off the dead? Yan Ping Zhang said, Sending off the dead is simple, what is there to tell? Guan Yi Wu said, I'd sure like to hear about it. Yan Ping Zhang said, Once a body's dead, how could it retain a self? You may burn it, sink it, or bury it. You can cover it up in brushwood and leave it in a ditch. You can dress it up in formal wear and inter it in a crypt. It's all a matter of circumstance, really. Guan Yi Wu turned to Bao Shu and Huang Ji and said, We too have presented the paths of life and death. When Zi Chan was minister of Zheng, he administered the state single-handedly. In three years, the good submitted to his influence, while the bad feared his prohibitions. The estate of Zheng was thus ordered properly, and other feudal lords dreaded it. Zi Chun had an older brother, named Gong Sun Chao, and a younger brother, named Gong Sun Mu. Chao was fond of wine, while Mu was fond of women. Chao had a thousand bottles of wine in his house, and a mountain of yeast. One could smell the place at least a hundred paces away. When he was drunk, he didn't know the state of the world, the regrets of human reason, the existence of his own house, the affinities of his relatives, or the sorrow or joy of life and death. Even if there was a flood, a fire, and an armed combat going right in front of him, he would not know it. As for Mr. Mu, in the backyard were several dozen rooms in a row, all filled with pretty girls of his choosing. When he was indulging in intercourse with his concubines, he'd shut out his family and friends, cut off social relationships, and escape to his backyards, where he'd spend night and day, unsatisfied if he had to emerge even once in three months. If there were pretty virgins in the neighborhood, he'd always try to bribe them to come to him, or seek them through go-betweens, not giving up till he's got them. Zi Chan worried about his sinful brothers, day and night. He went privately to Deng Ji to come up with a plan, saying, I've heard that one governs oneself to influence the family, and governs the family to influence the state. This saying goes from the near to the remote. I have made the state orderly, but my family is disorderly. Is this backwards? How can I help my brothers? Please tell me. Dong Shi said, I've been wondering for a long time, but didn't dare to be the first to speak. Why don't you discipline them in a timely fashion? Teach them the importance of nature and life, and introduce them to respect, courtesy, and duty. Zichan took Deng Shi's advice and visited his brothers in his free time, telling them, What makes humans superiors to animals is reason, and what reason calls for is courtesy and duty. When courtesy and duty are fulfilled, 
then honor and status arrive. If you are stirred by what touches your feelings, and become addicted to indulging desires, then your nation and your life are in peril. If you take my advice, you'll repent in the morning, and then be drawing salaries the same night. His brothers, Chao and Mu, said, We've known this for a long time, and we've made our choice long ago. Do you suppose we need you to tell us? Life is hard to come by, while death occurs easy. Who would think of waiting for death that occurs easily with a life that was hard to come by? You want to revere manners and duty to impress people, and overcome feelings and nature to acquire a reputation. We prefer death to that. We want to enjoy life to the fullest, so we only worry about being too full to eat or being too tired for intercourse, and we have no time to worry about getting a bad reputation or the precariousness of life and nature. Now, because your administration of the state can impress people, you want to disturb our minds with rhetoric and excite our ambitions by prosperity and pay. Is it not pitifully ignoble? We'd like to analyze this for you. Those who skillfully govern the external do not necessarily succeed in governing others, but they personally suffer along with them. Those who skillfully govern the internal do not necessarily let others run wild, but are naturally at ease with them. The way you govern the external, your laws may be effective for a while in one state, but they still don't suit people's minds. The way we govern the internal could be extended through the world, and the government would cease. We've always wanted to teach you this art. Now instead of this, you would teach us the other method. Zichan was at a loss for reply. The next day, he related this story to Dong Shi. Dong Shi said, You've been living with real people without even knowing it. Who says you're wise? The peace reigning in the state of Zheng is a coincidence. It is not your achievements. Duan Mu Shu of Wai was a descendant of the Shi Gong. He lived from the wealth of his ancestors and had a large hoard of gold at his home. Because he didn't have to work for a living, he did as he pleased. He did everything people want to do enjoyed everything people wished to enjoy. His state, with its pavilions and gazebos, gardens and ponds, his diet, his transportation, apparel, singers, musicians, and concubines, were comparable to that of the lords of Qi and Chu. When it came to what senses he wished to enjoy, what his ears wanted to listen to, and what his tongue wanted to taste, he would have it delivered to him, even if it were from abroad and not of a native product, just as if it were a local item. When he went traveling, he'd go anywhere, even over difficult terrain of mountains and rivers, however far the distance, just as someone else might make a short walk. The guests of his house would number in the hundreds on any given day. The fires in his kitchen were always going. Song and music never ceased within his parlors. What was left after providing for them, he distributed among his clan. He first distributed among his clan. What the clan had left over, then he distribute to the town and local villages. And what the town and locals had left over, he'd distribute throughout the state. When he'd reached the age of 60, and his vigor was on the decline, he forsook his household affairs and gave away all his chattels, his valuables, vehicles, wardrobe, and even his maids. Everything was gone within a year, with nothing left for his heirs. When he fell ill, he had no savings even for medicine. Then, when he had died, there was no money left to bury him. People throughout the state who had been beneficiaries of his generosity got together and raised funds to bury him and to restore his heir's property. When Qin Gu Li heard of this, he said, Duan Wu Shu was a madman. He disgraced his ancestors. When Duan Gan Sheng heard this, he said, Duan Wu Shu was an accomplished man. His virtue surpassed his ancestry. His conducts and his deeds were startling to the common mind, but acceptable to true reason. Most of the gentlemen of Wei pride themselves on ritualistic doctrine, which is certainly not sufficient for understanding this man's mind. Meng Sun Yang asked Yang Zhu, Suppose someone values life and takes care of his body, can he hope to avoid death that way? In principle, there is no one who does not die. Can one hope for long life? In principle, no one lives forever. Life cannot be preserved by valuing it. The body cannot be enhanced by caring for it. And what's the point of prolonging life, anyway? The likes and dislikes of the five senses are the same, past and present. Physical safety and danger are the same, past and present. The pains and pleasures of worldly affairs are the same, past and present. Change, order, and disorder are the same in the past and present. 
You've already heard this. You've already seen this. You've already been through this. Even a hundred years is too long, to say nothing of the misery of perpetual life. Meng Shenyang said, If so, then the early death is better than a long life. So you'd get your wish by treading on spears and swords, plunging into boiling water and fire. Master Yang Zhu said, That is not so. Since you're alive, let go and let it be. Fulfill your desires until you die. When you're going to die, let go and let it be. Go with it all the way, to release an extinction. Letting go of everything, letting it all be. In the meantime, why be anxious about what happens sooner or later? Yang Zhu said, Bo Chang Zhigao would not help anyone even if it took only a hair. He abandoned his state and retired to a farm in obscurity. The great Yu wouldn't use his whole body for his own benefit. He became palsied on one side. People of old wouldn't give away a single hair to benefit the world, and wouldn't take the whole world even if it was offered. If no one sacrificed a single hair, and no one tried to profit from the world, the world would be at peace. Mr. Cho asked Yang Zhu, If you could save the world by sacrificing a single hair from your head, would you do it? Mr. Yang Zhu said, The world certainly cannot be saved by only one hair. Mr. Cho said, If it really could be saved, though, would you do it? Mr. Yang Zhu did not answer. Mr. Cho went out and talked to Meng Sun Yang. Meng Sun Yang said, You didn't understand the master's intention. Let me try to tell it to you. If you could obtain 10,000 pieces of gold at the cost of injuring your skin, would you do it? I would, said Mr. Cho. Meng Shun Yang said, If you could get the whole country... By cutting off one of your limbs, would you do it? Mr. Cho remained silent, and there was a pause. Mr. Sun Yang said, A hair is slighter than skin. Skin is slighter than a limb. That is much clear. However, individual hairs mount up to skin, while the skin mounts up to a limb. Since a hair is ten thousandth of a whole body, how can you treat it lightly if it is part of the whole? Mr. Cho said, I can't answer you. But if we question Lao Dan and Guan Yi with your words, then what you say is right. If we question Great Yu and Mo Di with my words, then what I say is right. Meng Shenyang turned to his disciples and talked about something else. Yang Zhu said, Everyone admires Shun, Yu, the Duke of Zhou, Confucius, while everyone detests Jie and Zhou. Yet Shun plowed fields north of the river and made pottery at Thunder Marsh. He never got a moment's rest, and never had rich food. He was not loved by his parents, and was not treated kindly by his siblings as one of the family. When he was 30 years old, he got married without telling his parents. When Yao abdicated the throne to him, he was already old, and his intellect was already deteriorating. His own son was incompetent, so he abdicated the throne to Yu. He had worries all his life. He was one of the most miserable people on the planet. Yu's father worked on flood control, but his project was not completed, and he was executed at Feather Mountain. Yu took up the project after him, in the employ of his enemy, thoroughly absorbed in his earthworks. When his children were born, he never named them. When he passed by his house, he didn't go inside. His body became palsied on one side, and his hands and feet were calloused like mitts. When Shun abdicated the throne to him, he kept his residence humble, but beautified his ritual hat. He had worries all his life, and he was one of the most troubled people on the planet. When King Wu died, King Cheng was still young, so Duke of Zhou took the charge of the administration of the land in his stead. The Duke of Shao was dissatisfied, and sowed criticism throughout the states. The Duke of Zhou lived in the east for three years. He executed his older brother, and exiled his younger brother, barely surviving himself. He had worries all his life, and he was one of the most imperiled and threatened people on the planet. Confucius explained the path of emperors and kings, and responded to the invitations of lords at his time. Yet a tree was felled in an attempt to crush him in Song. He had disappeared from Wai, and was arrested at Shangzhu, and surrounded between Chen and Chai, and he was constrained by the Li clan, and insulted by Yang Hu. He had worries all his life, and Confucius was one of the most harried people on the planet. In sum, 
These four sages never had a day's enjoyment all their lives, but after they died, they've been famous for so long generations. So reputation is not obtained by reality. Even if you praised them, they would never know it. And even if you rewarded them, they would never know. No different from tree stumps. G.A. lived on wealth, accumulated over generations, and occupied the throne with cunning capability of keeping off subordinates, and threat enough to make the land tremble. He indulged in pleasures of sense, and did whatever he willed. Marry all his life, he was one of the most indulgent men on the planet. Zhou also lived on wealth accumulated over the generations, and occupied a throne. His authority was exerted everywhere. None would not follow his will. He indulged his passions in an enormous palace, giving free rein to his lusts all night long, not troubling himself with courtesy and justice. He lived merrily until his execution. He was one of the greatest libertines on the whole planet. These two villains had the pleasure of indulging their desires while alive, but after death they were saddled with reputations of ignorance and brutality. So the reality is not given by reputation. Even if you criticize them, they wouldn't know it. And even if you censored them, they would never know it. Would they be any different from tree stumps? Though the four sages are objects of admiration, they all suffered in the end. All the family died, just the same. While these two villains are object of contempt and hatred, they had fun all their lives to the end, and they finally died too, just the same, like tree stumps. Yang Zhu saw the king of Liang, and talked about governing the land like operating it in the palm of his hand. The king of Liang said, You have one wife and one concubine, and you still can't keep order. You have barely half an acre of a garden, and you still can't keep it weeded. So how can you speak of governing a land like operating it in the palm of one's hand? Yang Zhu said, Have you ever seen a shepherd? Let a boy follow a flock of a hundred sheep with a cane. When he wants to go east, they go east. When he wants to go west, they go west. Now suppose Yao was leading a single sheep, with Shun following up, carrying a cane. They wouldn't be able to move forward. Furthermore, I have heard that a fish that could swallow a whole boat does not swim in a rivulet. Wild swans fly high and do not gather on mud pebbles. Why? Because their aim is in the distance. Music of the classics cannot follow complicated dance, because the melody is too slow. This is what is meant by saying that one who is going to govern the great does not govern the small and one who accomplishes great works, does not do little things. Yang Zhu said, The events of high antiquity have passed away. Who remembers them? The affairs of the three august ones are much lost as extent. The affairs of the five emperors are as much a dream as a memory. The affairs of the three kings are as obscure as they are evident. Not one of a million is known, and the affairs of a lifetime may sometimes be seen or heard, but not one in ten thousand is known. There is no telling how many years have passed since high antiquity to the present day, but in three hundred thousand years since Fu Shi, wisdom and folly, good and bad, success and failure, right and wrong, have all passed away. Sooner or later, it is to be concerned with the blame and praise of one time, as to torment mind and body. This is all in the interest of a reputation centuries after your death can hardly benefit dry bones. What fun is life then? Yang Zhu said, Humans resemble the pairing of sky and earth, and have the nature of five constants in their hearts. They are the most conscious of living creatures. Humans' nails and teeth are not sufficient to provide defense or protection. Their skin does not provide adequate resistance by itself. Their mobility does not sufficiently enable them to pursue advantage or to truly escape harm. They have no fur or feathers to fend off the cold, and they need to rely on material things for their subsistence. They rely on intelligence rather than strength. For what is valuable about intelligence is its value in preserving ourselves. What is mean about strength is the meanness of interfering with things. Nevertheless, this body is not of our possession. So long as we're alive, we cannot but complete it. Things are not our own possessions either, but since they exist, we can't get away from them. The body is certainly the basis of life, and things are the basis of subsistence, and though we complete ourselves, we cannot possess our bodies, and though we cannot do without things, we cannot possess those things. To be possessive about your body, to be possessive about your things, 
is to arbitrarily be selfish about a body that belongs to the world, to arbitrarily privatize things that belong to the world. Yet, it seems only sages can refrain from arbitrarily privatizing bodies belonging to the world, and things belonging to the world. Only perfect people can be impartial towards bodies belonging to the world, and things belonging to the world. This is what is called reaching the ultimate. Yang Zhu said, The reasons people cannot rest are four. Striving for longevity, striving for fame, striving for status, and striving for money. With these four concerns, they fear ghosts, fear people, fear authority, and fear punishment. They are called unnatural people. They can be killed, or they can be granted life, because the control of their fate is in the external. If you don't defy destiny, why wish for long life? If you don't care about respect, why wish for fame? If you don't want power, why wish for status? If you don't crave wealth, why wish for money? Those like this are called natural people. They have no adversaries in this world, as control of their destiny is within. So, there is a saying that if people don't marry or serve in office, their sensual desires would be half gone. If people didn't eat or wear clothes, government would cease. A proverb of Zhou says that a farmer can be killed by inactivity. Going out early in the morning and coming home late at night, he considers it natural and normal. Eating beans and greens, he thinks that that's the finest dining. His skin and flesh are rough and thick. His sinews and joints are tight. Now put him in soft blankets and silk curtains. Feed him premium rice and meat and fragrant citrus fruits. He would get depressed and uncomfortable. With his inner irritation, he produces sickness. On the other hand, if the lords of Shang and Lu had the same amount of tillage as a farmer, they'd be worn out within an hour. So what country folk consider comfortable, what country folk consider fine, they think is unsurpassed in the world. In old times, there was a farmer in the state of Song who always wore hemp clothes. He barely made it through the winters. When spring came, he went to work. He warmed himself in the sun. He had no idea that there were big houses with warm rooms in the world, or quilted clothing or furs. He turned to his wife and said, No one knows the warmth of the sun on our backs. If we present it to our lord, we'll get a valuable reward. A wealthy man of the locale said to him, In ancient times, there was a man who liked broad beans, sesame stalk, and mugwort herbs. He praised them to the local gentry, who then obtained them and tried them. This hurt their mouths and upset their stomachs. They all scorned this man and despised him, so that man was very regretful. You too are like this. Yang Zhu said, A big house, fine clothing, rich food, and beautiful woman. If one has these four, what else is there to seek? Those who have these still seek something else insatiable. The insatiable are parasites of yin and yang. Their loyalty is inadequate to give security to their sovereigns. It is only enough to endanger themselves. Their justice is inadequate to benefit people. It is only enough to injure life. If security is given to rulers without loyalty, the name loyalty disappears. If people are profited without justice, the name justice disappears. When sovereign and subjects are all secure, and others and self are both benefited, this is the ancient Tao. Master Yu said, those who are detached from reputation have no worries. Master Lao said, reputation is a guest of reality. Yet lots of people seek reputation ceaselessly. So it is actually impossible to detach from reputation. Is reputation not to be considered a guest? Nowadays, you are respected and prosperous if you have a reputation. Lowly and despised if you have no reputation. When you're respected and prosperous, you're comfortable and happy. When you're lowly and despised, you're troubled and miserable. Trouble and misery offend nature, whereas comfort and happiness suit nature. These are what reality depends upon. So how can you detach from reputation, or consider reputation advantageous? Only bad men guard reputation to the detriment of reality. If you guard reputation to the detriment of reality, you will worry about being unable to avoid danger or destruction. Do you think that lies somewhere within the range of mere ease or misery? Book 8, The Book of Causality In the chorus of Liu Tzu's instruction by Hu Chu Tzu Lin, the latter said to him, You must familiarize yourself with the theory of consequence before you talk of regulating conduct. Liu Tzu said, Will you explain what you mean by the theory of consequence? 
Look at your shadow, said the master, and then you will know. Liet turned and looked at his shadow. When his body was bent, the shadow was crooked. When his body was upright, the shadow turned straight. Thus it appeared that the attributes of straightness and crookedness were not inherent in the shadow, but corresponded to certain positions of the body. Likewise, contraction and extension are not inherent in the subject, but take place in obedience to external causes. Holding this theory of consequence is to be home in the antecedent. The law of causality is the foundation of all knowledge. Quan Yin spoke to Master Liet Zhu, saying, If speech is sweet, the echo will be sweet. If speech is harsh, the echo will be harsh. If the body is long, the shadow will be long. If the body is short, the shadow will be short. Reputation is like an echo. Personal experiences like the shadow. Hence the saying, heed your words, and you will meet the harmonious response. Heed your actions, and you will find agreeable accord. Therefore, the sage observes the origin in order to know the issue, scrutinizes the past in order to know the future. Such is the principle whereby he attains foreknowledge. The standard of conduct lies within oneself. The testing of it lies in other men. We are impelled to love those who love us, and to hate those who hate us. Tang and Wu loved the empire, and therefore each became a king. Chie and Shou hated the empire, and therefore they perished. Here we have the test applied. He who does not follow Tao, when standard and test are both clear, may be likened to one who, when leaving a house, does not go by the door, or, when traveling abroad, does not keep to the straight road. To seek profit in this way is impossible. No one has ever profited himself by opposing natural laws. You may consider the virtues of Shen Nong, Yan Yu. You may examine the books of Yu, Xia, Shang, and Chou. You may weigh the utterances of great teachers and sages, but you will not find the instance of preservation or destruction, fullness or decay, which has not obeyed this law of supreme causality. Yan Hui said, The purpose of acquiring after the Tao is for prosperity. Now, if I acquire pearls, that's prosperity too. Why do I need the Tao? Master Liet said, Ji and Zhou perished because they only valued profit and disregarded the Tao. This is a good opportunity, as I haven't told this to you yet. People with no sense of duty only consume. That's all. They are chickens and dogs. Those who consume by force and contend arrogantly, with the victors exerting control, are raptors and beasts. And yet, they want people to honor them. That's impossible. If people do not respect you, danger and disgrace will come upon you. Liu Tzu learned archery and was able to hit a target. He asked the opinion to Quan Yin Zhu on his shooting. Do you know why you hit the target? said Quan Yin Zhu. No, I do not, was the reply. Then you are not good enough yet, rejoined Quan Yin Zhu. Liu Tzu withdrew and practiced for three years, after which he presented himself. Quan Yin Zhu asked, as before, Do you know why you hit the target? Yes, said Liu Tzu. I do. In that case, all is well. Hold that knowledge fast, and don't let it slip. Mental and bodily equilibrium are to be sought within oneself. Once you know the causal process which makes you hit the target, you'll be able to determine the operation of destiny beforehand, and when you let the arrow fly, you will make no mistake. The above principle does not only apply to shooting arrows, but also to the government of a state, and to personal conduct. Therefore, the sage investigates not the mere facts of preservation and destruction, but the causes which bring them about. Liu Tzu said, Those who excel in beauty become vain. Those who excel in strength become violent. To such, it is useless to speak of Tao. He who is not yet turning gray will surely err if he but speak of Tao, much less can he put it into practice. No man will confide in one who shows himself aggressive, and he whom no man confides will remain solitary and without support. The arrogant and the aggressive will accept no confidences, even if they are made. Their mental attitude to others will make one of distrust, and they keep their ears and eyes blocked. Who can render them assistance? The wise man puts his trust in others. Thus he reaches fullness of years without decay, the perfection of wisdom without bewilderment. In the government of a state, then, the hardest thing is to recognize the worth of others, and not to rely upon one's own. If you succeed in recognizing wealth, 
then the wise will think out plans for you, and able to act for you, and never rejecting talent from outside, you will find states easy to govern. There was once a man in Sung who carved a mulberry leaf out of jade for his prince. It took him three years to complete it, and it mutated nature so exquisitely in its down, its glossiness, and its general configuration from tip to stem, that, if placed in a heap of real mulberry leaves, one could not distinguish one from the other. This man was subsequently given a pension by the Song State as a reward for his skill. Liet Tzu heard of it, and said, If it took heaven three years to make a single leaf, there should be very few trees with leaves on them. The sage will rely not so much on human science and skill as on the operations of the Tao. The master Liet Tzu was very poor, and his face always wore a hungry look. A certain stranger spoke to it to Su Yang of Chung. Liet Tzu, he said, is a scholar in possession of Tao, yet here he is, living in destitution, within your own excellency's domain. It surely cannot be that you have no liking for scholars? Su Yang then directed that an official allowance of grain should be sent to Mr. Liet Tzu. Liet Tzu came to receive the messengers, made two low bows, and then declined the gifts of grain, whereupon the messengers were went away, and Liet Tzu returned to his house. There, he was confronted by his wife, who beat her breast and cried aloud, I have always understood that the wife and a family of a man of Tao live a life of ease and pleasure. Yet now, when his honesty sends you a present of food on account of your starved appearance, you refuse to accept it, Mr. Liet Tzu. I suppose you will call it destiny. Then, the master Liet Tzu smiled and replied, the minister did not know about me himself. His presence of grain were made on the suggestion of another. If it had been a question of punishing me, that too would have been done at someone else's prompting. That is the reason I did not accept the gift. Later on, the masses rose in actual rebellion against Yang Tzu and slew him. It is implied that Liet Tzu's independence of spirit then saved his life, inasmuch as a pensioner would have shared the fate of his patron by association by the angry mob. Mr. Shi of Lu had two sons, one of whom was a scholar, the other was a soldier. The former found his accomplishments in the means of ingratiating himself with the Marquis of Qi, who engaged him as a tutor to the young princes. The other brother proceeded to Chu, and won favor of the king of that state by his military talent. The king was so well pleased that he installed him as head of his troops. Thus, both of these brothers succeeded in enriching their family and shedding luster on his clan. Now. A certain Mr. Meng, the neighbor of Mr. Shi of two great sons, also had two sons, the same professions, but were straitened by poverty. Envying the affluence of the Shi family, Mr. Meng called his neighbor's house and wanted to know the secret of their rapid rise in the world. The two brothers readily gave him the desired information, whereupon the oldest son immediately set off for the state of Qin, hoping that his cultural attainments would recommend him to the king of that state. But the king said, at the present moment, all the feudal princes are struggling to outbid one another in power, and the great essential is to keep up a large army. If I tried to govern my state on the lines of benevolence and righteousness, ruin and annihilation would be the outcome. So then, he had the scholar castrated and turned him away. The second son, meanwhile, had gone to Wai, hoping that his military knowledge would find him in a good stead. But the Marquis of Wai said to him, Mine is a weak state, hedged in by powerful states. Wai is bounded up by Qin and Shi to the north, Lu to the east, and Chong to the south. My method of preserving tranquility and preserving my state is to show subservience to the larger states and consolate to the lesser ones. If I were to rely on an armed force, I would only expect utter destruction. I must not allow this man to depart my land unscathed, or he may find his way to another state and be a terrible thorn in my side. So, without ado, he cut the feet off of this soldier and sent him back to Lu. On the return, the whole family fell to beating their breasts in despair and uttered insults on Mr. Shi. Mr. Shi, however, said, Success consists of hitting off the right moment, while missing it means failure. While your methods were identical to mine, only the result was different. That is not due to any flaw of the action itself but simply because your actions were not well-timed. Nothing in ordering of this world is either at all times right or at all times wrong. What formerly passed current may nowadays be rejected. What is now rejected may, 
by and by, come to use again. The fact that a thing is in use, or in disuse, forms no criteria whether it's right or wrong. There is no fixed rule for seizing opportunities, hitting off the right moment, or adapting to your circumstances. It is all a matter of native innate wit. If you are deficient in that, you may possess the learning of a Confucius, or the strategic gifts of Longshang, yet you will remain poor wherever you may be. The Hmong family were now in a more resigned frame of mind, and their indignation had subsided. You are right, they said. Please say no more about it, Mr. Shi. Duke Wen of Qin put an army into the field, with the intention of attacking the Duke of Wei. Whereat, Zhu Chu threw his head back and laughed. On being asked the reason for his behavior, he replied, I was thinking of the experience of a neighbor of mine, who was escorting his wife to visit her own family. On the way, he came across a woman tending silkworms, who attracted him greatly, and he fell into conversation with her. Happening to look up, what should he see but his own wife, also receiving the intentions of an admirer? It was the recollection of this incident, which made me laugh so. The duke saw the point, and forthwith turned his army home. Before he got back, an invading force had already crossed his northern border. As you behave to others, others behave to you. He who rides roughshod towards the accomplishment of his own desires, in the belief it will not incur others to do the like, what you do to others, others may do to you. In the Qin state, which was infested with banditry, there lived a certain Qi Yong, who was able to tell a criminal by his face. By examining the expression on his eyes, he could read the innermost thoughts of a man, and call him right or wrong. The Marquis of Qin employed him in the inspection of hundreds of thousands of robbers, and he never missed a single one. The Marquis expressed delight in Wen Su of Chao, saying, I have a man who, single-handedly, is ridding my whole nation of crime. He saves me the necessity of employing a wide staff of police. Wen Su replied, If your highness relies on a detective for catching criminals, you will never get rid of them. And what is more, Chi Young is sooner or later to meet a violent end at the hand of robbers. Meanwhile, a band of robbers were plotting together. This Chi Young, they said, is an enemy who is trying to exterminate us. On one day they stole upon him in body and murdered him. When the Marquis of Qin heard the news, he was greatly alarmed and sent for Wen Tzu. Your prophecy has come true, sir, he said. Chi Young is dead. What means have I to adopt the catching of robbers now? In Chou, replied Wen Su, we have a proverb. Search not the ocean depths for fish. Calamities come upon those who pry in hidden mysteries. If you want to quit of robbers, the best thing your highness can do is promote the worthy to office. Let them instruct and enlighten their sovereign on one hand, and reform the masses below them in the other. If once the people acquire a sense of shame, you will not find them turning to banditry. The Marquis then appointed Sui Hui to be Prime Minister, and all the robbers fled to the Qin state. Apply cleverness to ferret out wrongdoing, and the cunning rogue will escape. Using the gift of intuition to expose crime, only excite hatred from the wicked. That sagacity is an evil is no empty saying. The Duke of Bai asked Confucius, Can one speak discreetly to another? Confucius did not reply. The Duke of Bai asked, What if one tossed a stone in water? Confucius said, A good swimmer could retrieve it. What if water was poured into water? Confucius said, Where rivers join, someone with a sensitive tongue could still distinguish their water by taste. The Duke of Bai said, So it's impossible to speak discreetly to another? Confucius said, How is it impossible? But only one who knows what words mean can do so. One who knows what words mean does not speak with words. Those who go after fish get wet. Those in pursuit of beasts run. But not because they like to. Therefore, the supreme speech is unspoken. The supreme act is unplanned. What shallow knowledge contends over is trivial. The Duke of Bai didn't get it, and he wound up dead in his bathhouse. Zhao Jiangxi had Ji Xin Muji attack the Di people. He overcame them and took two cities. He had a messenger report back. Zhang Xi, who was just then dining, looked worried. Those around him said, two cities conquered in one day is something people would celebrate. 
Why do I look worried now? Zhang Shi said, A flood tide lasts no more than three days. A storm doesn't last all day. High noon doesn't last a moment. Now the Zhao clan has no history of benevolent conduct. So if two cities fall to us in one day, destruction may overcome us too. When Confucius heard of this, he said, The Zhao clan will flourish. That is, anxiety is the means of creating success, while celebration is a means of bringing on destruction. Victory is not the difficult thing. What is hard is to keep it. This is the way a wise ruler maintains supremacy, so that fortune exceeds the future generations. Qi, Chu, Wu, and Yue were all victorious at some point, but eventually these nations got destroyed. They never succeeded in maintaining supremacy for long. Only rulers who have the Tao can maintain supremacy. Confucius was strong enough to lift the bolt on a state border gate, yet he was unwilling to be famed for strength. Mu Ji that outdid Gong Shu Ban, yet he was unwilling to be famed for military science. So, those who are good at maintaining superiority consider strength to be a weakness. In Song, there are people who avidly practiced humanity and justice for three generations. For no reason, a black cow belonging to a family gave birth to a white calf, and they asked Confucius about it. Confucius said, This is an auspicious omen. Offer it to heaven. In a year, the father of the house had gone blind for no reason, and the cow had produced another white calf. The father had his son ask the question. Confucius again, his son said. You asked about this before and you lost your eyesight. Why ask again? The father said, the words of sages are illogical at first, but only can make sense later. The matter is not yet resolved. Ask him again. The son then questioned Confucius again. Confucius said, It's an auspicious omen, and again advised him to sacrifice the white calf. The son went home and conveyed these directions. In a year, the son too had gone blind for no reason. Subsequently, the state of Chu attacked the state of Song and besieged their capital city. The inhabitants sold their children to eat, split bones of corpses and cooked them. All the able-bodied climbed the walls to fight, and more than half of them died. His father and son, however, having a disability, were both exempted from the draft. When the siege was lifted, they both recovered from their blindness and lived happily. There was an itinerant from Song who sought employment with Song Yuan as an entertainer. Song Yuan invited him and had him show his skills. Fixing stilts to his legs twice as tall as he, he gambled about with them, juggled seven swords all the while, and keeping five of the swords in the air at all times. Lord Yuan was impressed and immediately rewarded him with gold and silks. Yet another itinerant who could do acrobatics too heard about this and went to offer to perform to Lord Yuan. Enraged, Lord Yuan said, There is someone with unusual skills who performed me before. His skills were useless, but it so happened I was entertained, and therefore I gave him gold and silk. Now this fellow, who must have heard about this, come too, hoping also to get a reward from me too. The Lord had the acrobat arrested, and he was going to have him killed, but he let the acrobat go after a month. Duke Mu of Qin said to Po Lo, a famous judge of horses. You look advanced in years. Is there any member of your family who I could employ to look for horses in your stead? Polo replied, A good horse can be picked out by its general build and appearance, but a truly great horse, one that raises no dust and leaves no tracks, is something evanescent and fleeting, elusive as the thin air. The talent of my sons lies on the lower plane altogether, they can tell a good horse when they see one, but they cannot tell a profound horse. I have a friend, however, named Chu Fang Kao, a hawker of fuel and vegetables, who in things appertaining to horses is no wise my inferior. Go see him. Duke Mu did so and met Chu Fang Kao, and subsequently dispatched him in a quest for a horse. Three months later, he returned with news that Chu Fang Kao had found one. It is now in Shang Chu, he added. What kind of horse is it? asked the duke. Oh, it's a dun-colored mare, was the reply. However, on someone being sent to fetch the horse, the animal turned out to be a coal-black stallion. Much displeased, the duke sent for Po Lo. That friend of yours, 
he said, who I commissioned to look for a horse, has made a nice mess of things. He cannot even distinguish a beast's color or sex. What on earth does this man know about horses? Polo heaved a sigh of satisfaction. Has he really got as far as that? he cried. Ah, then he is worth a thousand of me put together. There is no comparison at all between us. What Chu Fan Kao keeps in his view is the spiritual mechanisms. In making sure of the essential, he forgets the homely details, intent on only seeing the inward quality. He loses sight of the external, he sees what he wants to see, and does not see what he does not want to see. He looks at things he ought to look at, and neglects those things he need not look at. So clever a judge of horses is Chu Fan Kao that he has it in him to judge something better than horses. And when the horse arrived, it turned out to be indeed one of the finest horses in the realm. King Zhuang of Zhou asked Zhang He, How is the state to be governed? Zhang He said, I understand how to govern oneself, but I don't understand how to govern a state. The king said, I am in charge of the ancestral temple, and the earth and the grain shrines, and I wish to learn how to preserve them. Jean He said, I have never heard of anyone who was personally orderly, but whose state was in chaos. I have never heard of anyone who was personally disorderly, yet whose state was orderly. So, the root must be then in the individual. I dare not reply about the branches. The King of Chu said, good. The elder of Fox Hill said to Su Shun Ao, people have three resentments. Do you know them? Su Shun Ao said, what do you mean? Elder Fox Hill said, Those of high status, people envy. Those in powerful offices, rulers dislike. Those with rich payments, resentment overtakes. Su Shun Ao said, The higher my rank, the humbler my ambitions. The more powerful my office, the more careful my attention. The higher my salary, the more extensive my charity. Can I escape the three resentments this way? When Su Shun Ao fell ill and was about to die, he admonished his son. The king repeatedly tried to make me his vassal, but I wouldn't accept. When I die, the king will make you his vassal. Don't accept land with rich soil. There is a place between Chu and Yue called Dwarf Hill. Its soil is not as good and its reputation is very bad. The people of Chu believe in ghosts, while the people of Yue believe in curses. This is the only place you can keep forever. When Su Shun Ao died, the king, in fact, did vassalize the son with fine land. His son refused and asked for Dwarf Hill. This was granted, and since then, Su Shun Ao's son has never lost it. Nue Chue was a great scholar of the god Shang Di. Traveling to Han Dan, he was beset by bandits at Odd Sands River. They took all his clothing all his luggage, and his carriage. So Nui went his way on foot. Seeing him so nonchalant, the bandits went after him and asked him the reason. Nui said, A noble man does not let material means harm what they support. The bandits exclaimed what a wise man he was, but then they said among themselves, With wisdom like that, if he meets the Lord of Zhao, he'll get him to do something about us. This surely means trouble for us. We'd better kill him. And so they chased Dwei Chui down and killed him. A man from Yan heard of this and gathered his family to warn them. If you run into bandits, don't be like Nui Chui of Shangdi. Everyone took a lesson. Before long, the young man's brother set off on a trip to Qin. As it turned out, he encountered bandits along the way. Remembering his older brother's warning, he resisted the bandits stoutly, and he was no match for them. But yet he followed them, merely asking for his things. The bandits said angrily, We were generous just to let you go, yet you keep following us. We're going to leave an obvious trail. Since we're bandits, why would we be humane? So they killed him, and they murdered five or more of his companions as well. Mr. Yu was a wealthy man of the Wai state. His household was rolling in riches, with hordes of money and silk and other valuables, which were quite incalculable. It was his custom to have banquets served to the accompaniment of music in the high upper hall overlooking the main road, where he and his friends would sit drinking together of wine and amusing themselves with bouts of dice. One day, 
a party of young gallants happened to pass along the road. In the chamber above, dice play was going on as usual, and a lucky throw of the dice, which resulted in the capture of both fishes, evoked a loud burst of laughter from the players. Precisely at that moment, it happened that an eagle that was flying overhead dropped a carcass of a rat in the midst of the company outside. The young men held an angry consolation on the spot. This Mr. Yu, they said, has been enjoying his wealth for many a day, and was always treating his neighbors in the most arrogant of spirits. And now, although we have never offended him in his life, he insults us with this dead rat. If such an outrage goes unavenged, the world will look upon us as a set of cowards. Let us summon up our innermost resolution, and combine with one accord to wipe him and his family out of existence. The whole party signified their agreement, and when the evening of that day appointed had to come, they collected, fully armed for the attack, and exterminated every member of the family of Yu. Pride and extravagance lead to calamity and ruin in more ways than one. Mr. Yu's family was destroyed, although this particular instance he had no thought of insulting others. Nevertheless, this catastrophe was from an habitual lack of modesty and courtesy in Mr. Yu's conduct. In the east of China, there was a man named Yuang Qingmu who set off on a journey, but was overcome by hunger on the way. A certain bandit from Hu Fu, of the name of Chu, saw him laying there, and fetched a bowl of rice in order to feed him. After swallowing three mouthfuls, Yuan Cheng Mu opened his eyes and murmured, Who are you? I am a native of Hu Fu. My name is Chu, said the bandit. Oh, misery! cried Yuang Ching Mu. Are you not a robber from Chu? Are you not the great bandit Chu? What are you feeding me for? I am an honest man and I cannot eat this food. So saying, he clutched the ground with both hands and began retching and coughing in order to vomit out the rice. Not succeeding, he fell flat on his face and died. Now, the man from Hu Fu was a robber, no doubt, but the food he brought was not affected thereby. Because the man was a criminal, to refuse to eat the food he offers you on the ground that it is tainted with crime is to have lost all the power of discriminating between the normal and the real. Zhu Li Shu worked for Duke Ao of Zhu, but he quit and went to live by the ocean because he thought he wasn't being recognized. In the summer, he fed on water chestnuts. In the winter, he ate tree chestnuts. When Duke Ao of Zhu had trouble, Zhu Li Shu left his friends to go sacrifice his life for him. His friends said, You left because you thought you weren't being given your due recognition, yet now you're going to sacrifice your life for him. This is making no distinction between being recognized and not being recognized. Zhu Li Shu said, No, not so. I left because I thought I wasn't getting recognition. Now, if I die, that means he does not in fact acknowledge me. I am going to sacrifice my life for him, to shame future rulers who don't acknowledge their good ministers. Generally speaking, to sacrifice your life for someone who acknowledges you, but not for someone who doesn't, is the straightforward way to go. Zhu Li Shu may be said to be one who forgot himself on account of resentment. Yang Zhu said, Those who make their output beneficial are rewarded in turn. Harm comes to those who from whom resentment proceeds. What emerges from here and reverberates on the outside is a simple sense, so savants are careful about what they put out. A neighbor of Master Yang Zhu lost a sheep. Having mustered his people, he asked Mr. Yang Zhu for his servants to go look for it. Master Yang Zhu said, Hey, you've only lost one sheep. Why do you need so many to go after it? The neighbor replied, There's a lot of forks in the road. When they returned, Master Yang Zhu asked his neighbor, did you find the sheep? No, we lost it. How could you lose it? Because the forks in the road also had forks in the road. We didn't know where to go, so we just came back. A look of distress came over Master Yang Zhu's face, but didn't speak for some time, and didn't smile for the rest of the day. His students wondered about this and asked, A sheep is an inexpensive animal, and it didn't belong to you anyway, so why have you stopped speaking and smiling, Master? Master Yang didn't reply, and his students didn't get what he intended. The disciple, Meng Shun Yang, went off and told the master of the mind capital. Another day, the master of the mind capital and Meng Shun Yang 
went to Master Yang together and posed a series of questions. Once, there were three brothers who traveled around Qi and Lu, studied with the same teachers, and returned thoroughly versed in the principles of humaneness and justice. Their father asked, what is the path of humaneness and justice? The elder son said, Humaneness and justice would have for us care for ourselves more than our honor. The middle son said, Humaneness and justice would have us sacrifice ourselves to be honorable. And the youngest said, Humaneness and justice would have us complete in both ourselves and in our honor. These three policies are mutually contradictory, yet all of them come from Confucius. Who is right? Who is wrong? Master Yang Zhu said, there once was a man who lived by a river, used to the water. He was a strong swimmer. He made his living running a ferry boat, which yielded enough profit to feed a hundred people. Many people came from far to learn from him, but nearly half of them drowned. They had come to learn to swim, not to learn to sink. But the gain and loss turned out this way. Who do you think is right, and who was in the wrong? The master of the mind capital left in silence. Meng Shenyang pressed him, saying, why was your question so indirect, and your master's reply so odd? My perplexity is even worse now. The master of mind capital said, The sheep got lost on the main road because of the multitude of byways. Scholars waste their lives because of a multitude of formulas. Studies may not be different or disparate on the outset, but this is how different the outcomes can be. Only returning to sameness and restoring unity can one eliminate gain and loss. You've been in the teacher's school, and studied the teacher's way for a long time, yet you don't understand the teacher's examples. What a pity you are. Yang Chu's brother, named Pu, went out one day wearing a suit of white clothing. It came on to rain, so that he had to change and come back dressed in a suit of black. His dog failed to recognize him in this black clothing, and rushed at him. This made Yang Pu angry, and he was going to give the dog a slap. When Yang Chu said, don't beat him, you're no wiser than he. For, suppose your dog went away white and came back black. Do you mean to tell me you wouldn't think it weird? Yang Chu said, you may do good without thinking about fame, but fame will follow in its wake. Fame makes no tryst with gain, but gain will come all the same. Gain makes no tryst with strife, but strife will certainly ensue. Therefore, the superior man is very cautious about doing good. Once there was a man who claimed to know the way to immortality, and the Lord of Yan sent an emissary to learn it. He did not succeed, and the man who'd made the claim had died. The Lord of Yan was furious, and he was going to have the emissary executed. A favorable minister admonished, People worry about nothing so much as death, and one who values nothing so much as life. If he lost his own life, how could he have enabled you not to die? so the Lord didn't execute the emissary. A certain Qi Ji also wanted to learn the method. When he heard that there was a man who claimed it, he had died. He beat his breast to bitter lament. Hearing of this, Fu Ji laughed and said, What you want to study is immortality, yet you're still bitter now that the man has died. You don't know how to learn. Hu Ji said, Fu Ji's statement is wrong. There are those who know arts they cannot practice, and there are those who can practice but have no art. There was a man of Wei, who was good at calculation and taught his secret to his son on his deathbed. His son memorized his instructions, but could never carry them out. Someone else asked him, and he told him what his father had said. The inquirer made use of these skills and practiced that art, no different from the other man's father. So why couldn't someone who died tell the art of living? The good people of Han Tan were in the habit. Every New Year's Day, of presenting their governor, Chen Zhu, with a number of live pigeons. This pleased the governor very much, so he liberally awarded the donors. To a stranger who asked the meaning of this tradition, Chen Zhu explained that the release of living creatures on New Year's Day was a sign of benevolent disposition. But, rejoined the stranger, the people who are aware of His Excellency's whim no doubt exert themselves to catch as many pigeons as possible, and a large number must get killed in the process. If you really wish to let the birds live, the best way would be to prohibit the people from capturing the pigeons at all. If they would have to be caught first in order to be released, the kindness does not compensate for the cruelty. Chen Su acknowledged that man was right. Mr. Chen, of the Qi state, was holding an ancestral banquet in his house, to which a thousand guests were bidden to come. As he sat in their midst, many came up to him with presents of fish and wild game. 
Eyeing them approvingly, he exclaimed with unction, How generous is heaven to man! It makes the five kinds of grain to grow, and creates the finny and the feathered tribes, especially for our benefit. All Mr. Chen's guests applauded the sentiment to the echo, but a twenty-year-old son of Mr. Pao, regardless of the seniority, came forward and said, You are wrong, my lord. All the living creatures of the universe stand in the same category as ourselves, and there is no greater or intrinsic value to one from another. It is only a reason by size, strength, and cunning that a particular species gains the mastery over the other, or that one preys upon the other. None of them are produced in order to be subservient to the uses of another. Man catches and eats those which are fit for food. But how can it be maintained that heaven creates these expressly for man's use? Mosquitoes and gnats suck at man's blood. Tigers and wolves can eat us. But we do not therefore assert that heaven created man expressly for the benefit of mosquitoes and gnats, or to provide meat for tigers and wolves. There once was a pauper of Chi, who used to beg in the city market. At the city market, they were bothered by his frequency, and no one would give him anything. Finally, he went to the stables of the Qian clan, and did chores for the horse doctor to get something to eat. The townspeople teased him, saying, Isn't it embarrassing to live off of a horse doctor? The beggar cried, There's nothing in this world more embarrassing than begging. If I'm not embarrassed to beg, why should I be embarrassed about a horse doctor? A man from Song was walking along the road when he finally found a tally someone had lost. He returned home and hid it away. Privately counting the notches, he told his neighbor, I'm going to be rich! A man had a dead phoenix tree. His neighbor's father said a dead phoenix tree is unlucky, so the neighbor was scared of cutting it down. Then, the neighbor's father asked for it to use for firewood. The man was displeased. He said, My neighbor's father got to cut it down just because he wanted firewood. He's my neighbor, yet such a crooked deceiver. How can that be alright? A man, having lost his axe, suspected his neighbor's son of having taken it. Certain peculiarities of his gait, his facial expressions and his speech, marked him out truly as the thief. In his actions, his movement, and in fact his whole demeanor, it was plainly written that he and none other had taken the axe. By and by, however, while digging in a valley, the owner came across the missing axe. The next day, when he saw the neighbor's son again, he found no trace of guilt in his movements, his actions, or his demeanor. The man in whose mind suspicion is at work let himself be carried away by utterly distorted fancies, until at last he sees white as black and detects squareness within a circle. The Duke of Bai was contemplating a rebellion. After court one day, he stood there with his riding crop upside down. The metal tip pierced his chin, and blood flowed to the ground. Yet he never noticed it. A man of Zhang heard this and said, If he'll forget his chin, what won't he forget? With your attention is fix when your attention is fixated, you may stumble on a stump or a pothole, or bump your head on a tree, without even being aware of it yourself. There was a man in the Qi state who had a burning lust for gold. Rising early one morning, he dressed, put on his hat, and went into the marketplace, where he proceeded to seize and carry off the gold from a money changer's shop. An ordinary thief would have gone at night, probably naked, after smearing his body in dark paint. He was arrested by the police, who were puzzled to know why he had committed the crime and theft in daylight when everyone was around. When I was taking the gold, he replied, I did not see anybody at all. What I saw was the gold, and nothing but the gold. Thus ends the book of Lietzu. Thank you for listening.